mess, but hey, this nice bookcase back here, it looks all neat, so. That's nice. Yeah. Jim, your, your chairman Slack, and I saw Chair Shabair's photos on social media of the Regents meeting, and he sure did dress it up, man. Got a pinstripe suit on. Hey, Lola. I have to tell you, that picture was not from yesterday. <laughs> that was. Uh, I, I was muted. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. Mark, that's the power of digital media. You can put any picture you want to and associate it with an event, regardless if they're contemporaneous or not. So if somebody else has controls, and, and, and he, even though he has a script and tries to run off of the script, somebody took over the photo piece is what you're telling me. I'm just suggesting that's a possibility. I got you. I don't want you to get in my company on that discussion, Jim. I need you to still be in good graces. <laughs> Hmm. I don't see we have a quorum yet. I know we can't blame it on traffic. <laughs> hey, good morning, everyone. I just want to um, welcome you and remind you that we are streaming live on YouTube uh, for the remainder of the meeting. Thank you. I see speakers, Speaker Salters joined us. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir. Thank you very much. I think we're all uh, offering thanks <laughs> that you've joined us, Joe. All right. Especially Jimmy. Um, <laughs> I had been assigned the responsibility, should you have not uh, made your way onto the screen, to uh, provide a blessing. So I'm I glad can, to abdicate that responsibility back to you, Joe. I can easy, easily move off. <laughs> oh, please don't. No, I was praying hard for you to be joining us. I, maybe I have more uh, power than I thought. <laughs> you do, Jimmy. Oh, I see I've got a picture now. Good That's morning. Great. There you go. There, there you go. go. Yeah. Look like you ought to be on Toledo Bend. That, now that is a suggestion. What do we what need more for? Nine. Nine. Oh, 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 I see. Oh, okay. oh, 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 One, two, three, four, five, six. Sean's on, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that gives yeah. it nine. We've got a quorum. Yeah. Y'all ready to get started? <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning. I now call to order today's meeting of the Board of Supervisors for the University of Louisiana System. I'd like to welcome all of our board members and certainly our staff and anyone from the public who's attending with us today. As you know, due to current circumstances, we're allowed to hold our meeting via electronic means. Before we begin, Carol, will you please call the roll? Mr. Carter? Dr. Clark? Here. Dr. Condos? Here. Mr. Crawford? 
Ms. Donahoe. Present. Dr. Egan. Mr. Kitchen. Ms. Lodiger. Ms. Muffin. Here. Mr. Murphy. Here. Mr. Perkins. Ms. Pierre. Here. Mr. Robinson. Here. Mr. Romero. Here. Ms. Russell. I received a text from her. She's having some technical difficulties. Maybe the staff member can reach out. Okay. Mr. As well from Mr. Kitchen. Here. Okay, one, two. We have nine. All right. So we have a quorum. We do have a couple of folks trying to get in. Also, Mr. Kitchen's trying to uh, connect and he's having some difficulties. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that, Carol. At this time, I would ask Mr. Salter if he would please lead us in an invocation this morning. Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we will gather today. And Lord, I'd ask that you'd bless our deliberation. And Lord, perhaps at this time, like no other, certainly no other in our life, we face challenges as a state, as a nation, and, and the world. And Lord, we'd ask for your leadership and guidance. We'd ask that you'd provide us a hope. Uh, Lord, that you'd give us faith uh, and that you would uh, help us, Lord, to remember that uh, you are uh, all powerful and all things rest in your hands. And again, today, Lord, as we meet, we'd ask that you would be, direct us to regarding the decisions that we make. Uh, Lord, we pray that, uh, as always, that these decisions would be in the best interest of our students and our uh, taxpayers in our state. And Lord, I thank you in particular for all the uh, first responders, the caregivers, uh, levels, Lord, and uh, with ask that you would be with those, Lord, from the virus. We pray, Lord, for their healing, and Lord, we'd pray for those loved ones who've lost folks of uh, virus. Ask that you'd forgive us for our many sins, and we thank you many blessings for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Well Amen. said, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Salter. Uh, if I would. Um, for those while we're not speaking, if you don't mind muting, I'm getting a text from staff just indicating that we're getting some feedback maybe because of that. Um, so I appreciate you all's help and cooperation with that. In order to proceed with today's meeting, I need a motion and a second to accept the certificate of inability to operate due to compliance with the directives of the governor, our governor, the CDC, and local and state governing health authorities and officials. I could have a motion and say, move by a little down hope. Second by Mr. Robinson. Carol, if you'd call the roll. Dr. Jimmy Clark. Yes. Dr. Condos. Yes. Ms. Donahoe. Yes. Ms. Ms. Muffin. Yes. Mr. Murphy. Yes. Ms. Pierre. Yes. Mr. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. And Mr. Salter? Mr. Salter? Yes, yes. I didn't I call the other, I don't think they've got it going. Okay, thank you, Carol. I'd like to advise you that the content of today's Zoom meeting, including chat, is being recorded and subject to public records requests. So please keep in mind, keep that in mind while we conduct our business. Thank you. Dr. Henderson and staff for doing the legwork to accomplish this for us today. I, I certainly think that under the circumstances, technology has facilitated our ability to continue to deduct, conduct business on behalf of our colleges in the state. To those of you who are viewing this via Zoom, be reminded that anyone who wishes to make a public comment on a particular agenda item, must send a chat message to the moderator. In the message, please include your first and last names, affiliation, as well as the item number upon which you would like to comment. You'll be allowed to share your video audio at the appropriate time, or if you prefer, your comment can be read by a staff member of the UL system staff. Email public comment at ulsystem.edu. Uh, comments are limited to three minutes. Seems like forever ago, but our last 
traditional meeting. Uh, we had actions and I, I'll ask if we could have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of our February 28th meeting that was held in Natchitoches. Could I have a motion and a second? So moved. Moved second. by Ms. Murphy. Second by Ms. Donahoe. Uh, Carol, if you would call roll. Guys, just an FYI, under this format, in order to officiate uh, your vote, uh, we're gonna be required to record those votes via roll call. So Carol's gonna help us facilitate a little more interactive uh, voting today. Carol? Mr. Carter? I think I see Mr. Carter's there. Okay, Dr. Clark? Yes. Dr. Condos? Yes. Ms. Dunhoe? Yes. Ms. Methvin? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Ms. Romero? Yes. And Mr. Salter? Yes. Are there any other board members? I see Christine Russell on. Okay. Yes, I just texted her. Oh. Yes, this is Al Perkins. Okay, Mr. Perkins, thank you. And Mr. Um, did you say Mr. Carter? I, I saw Christine Russell's face in the background. It looked like someone was trying to help her get on online. Is She's Carol? being close. She's okay. trying to get the audio. Carol, oh, okay. Mr. Carter seems to be on, but we're not getting video and sound. So, but he does okay. appear to be connected. Okay, thank you. So Carol, we have a majority? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Today we are meeting as a committee of the whole and everyone can vote on all items. As has been our practice, the chairs of the committees conduct the business of each particular committee. Are there any questions relative to that format at this time? May have a motion to dispense with committee deliberations and meet as a committee of the whole. So moved. I have a motion. Second. Second, Virgil. Thank you, Virgil. Carol, if you would please call the roll. Mr. Carter? Here. Dr. Clark? Yes. Dr. Condos? Yes. Mr. Crawford? I don't think he's there yet. Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Mr. Kitchen? Ms. Lodiger? Ms. Methvin? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Perkins? Yeah, yes. Mr. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Ms. Pierre? I'm sorry, yes. Ms. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Mr. Salt? Yes. We have enough. Thank you, Carol. Ms. Donahoe, would you please address items under the Academic and Student Affairs Committee at this time? Yes, sir, I will. We have eight items on the Academic and Student Affairs Committee agenda today. There are six consent items that require approval. One item that is informational regarding the COVID-19 guidelines and one item that is a policy that does not require approval. Each member previously received executive summaries and associated information on these items. Dr. Janine Kahn, Provost and Vice President for the Academic Affairs will provide the report. Dr. Kahn? Yes, good morning. Thank you, Ms. Donahoe and good morning to you, Chair Romero, President Henderson and members of the board. It's good to see everyone, albeit via Zoom, and I hope all of you and your family members are doing well during these um, interesting times um, and challenging times. Uh, we do indeed have six items that require action by the board and two items that are informational in nature, and I'll quickly walk you through each. Agenda item E1 is a request from Grambling State University to uh, enter into an agreement uh, with Straighter Line Incorporated for a course and service agreement. Straighter Line is a provider of student success and college readiness services, including low-cost online general education courses. Grambling has been in partnership with Straighter Line since 2014. The university would now like to expand the partnership to better meet the needs of those students that aren't admissible, those that might be fa uh, facing financial hardship, and those who wish to return to college to pursue a general studies degree. 
Agenda items E2 and E3 pertain to Nichols State University. E2 is a request for approval to offer two new graduate certificates, one an educational technology facilitator and the other an educational technology leader. Both graduate certificates are designed to lead to Louisiana State's uh, teacher's add-on certification. The facilitator GC will be composed of four courses and completers will be very well versed in technology tools to enhance learning. The leader GC will be composed of eight courses and the completer will gain the skill sets needed to promote the integration of technology in a school system with the moral imperative of improving student learning outcomes. Both graduate certificates will be offered via online learning distance capabilities and all courses required for both graduate certificates are currently offered by Nichols. So both GCs will be able to be provided at no additional cost to Nichols. E3 is a request for approval of a letter of intent to offer a Master of Science in Clinical Nutrition and Dietetics Leadership. Currently, an individual has to earn a baccalaureate degree and complete a dietetic internship in order to sit for the national exam to become a registered dietitian a nutritionist. Effective 2024, the entry level eligibility requirement will change to a graduate degree. Currently, Nichols offers a BS in dietetics, which completes 15 students annually, and a dietetics internship that enrolls 14 students annually. In response to the new eligi eligibility education requirements, Nichols would like to pursue this master's degree. Last month, the board approved a similar request for Nichols State University. Agenda item E4 is a request from Southeastern Louisiana University for approval of a letter of intent to develop a new academic program leading to a Bachelor of Arts in Theater. Currently, Southeastern offers a, a Bachelor of General Studies with a minor in Theater, which enrolls approximately 40 to 50 students annually, as well as a BA in Art with a concentration in Theater Design, which has 14 students currently enrolled. The university would like to pull the concentration and minor together in order to offer a BA in Theater that will offer the study of theater and film with a focus on acting, stage management, and directing with a liberal arts environment. The proposed program is being created to train and matriculate a specialized workforce with the skills needed to contribute to Louisiana's rapidly growing theater and film industry. Agenda items E, F, and E6 are requests from the University of Louisiana Monroe. E5 is a request for approval of a letter of intent to develop a new program leading to a Bachelor of Science in Occupational Therapy Assistant. ULM has provided occupational therapy education through OT for over 46 years. The university currently offers an Associate of Science in Occupational Therapy Assistant, which completes an average of 27 students annually. And they also offer a Master of Occupational Therapy, which completes 28 students annually. In April 2019, the Accreditation Council for Occupational Therapy Education adopted a policy of dual entry degrees at both the associate level and baccalaureate level for OTAs. In order to produce more intellectually and socially sophisticated OTA practitioners and to academically prepare students for application to the MOT program, ULM would like to convert the existing 75 credit hour associate degree to a 120 credit hour Bachelor of Science in Occupational Therapy Assistant. And E6 is a request on behalf of the Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine for approval of an agreement between VCOM and the University of Louisiana system. As we're all aware and extremely excited about, VCOM is slated to open its new branch um, at ULM in July, 2020. In recognition of the high caliber students that graduate from the nine member institutions of the University of Louisiana system, v VCOM, via this proposed agreement, commits to interviewing a minimum of 10 students annually for each of the UL system institutions. And those students must, of course, meet specific standards. And if they do, they'll be guaranteed um, interview through the admissions program. And lastly, agenda item E7 is, is for information only. During the current COVID-19 crisis, the UL system has put in place student-centered guidelines that allow for flexibility when it comes to grading and course enrollment for spring 2020, as well as guidelines focused on ensuring the pandemic does not adversely impact our faculty. We are also establishing guidelines uh, specific to graduate students so that their academic progress is not impeded because of the current circumstance. 
All of these guidelines have been established with the goal of ensuring all of our faculty and students are supported during these difficult times. As a side note, it has been truly amazing to witness the resilience of our faculty and staff and students during this time. The creativity, compassion, and innovation that has been brought to bear in order to provide continuous instruction, instruction has truly been remarkable. We have all and we will, we have and will all continue to learn so very much from these circumstances that in no doubt will improve what we do for decades to come. And so those guidelines were shared uh, with members of the Academic and Student Affairs Committee um, within the last couple of weeks, but we wanted to make sure that all of the board members are aware of steps that we have made to protect and to support our faculty, staff, and students. At this time, I'd like to turn the agenda over to Ms. Erica Calais so that she can go over agenda item E8. Thank you, Dr. Khan. We have crafted a mental health policy to serve as an umbrella policy for UL system institutions. While it is broad enough to maintain campus autonomy, it is specific enough to ensure that all of our campuses are providing the appropriate mental health services for our students. The University of Louisiana system is fully committed to fostering communities of support for students that promote the emotional and mental well being of students. For students to achieve academic success, personal development, and lifelong wellness, the University of Louisiana system and its institutions must make students' mental health a priority. Mental health is something that affects all students on campus. Poor mental health hinders students' academic success. Untreated mental health issues may lead to lower GPAs, discontinuous enrollment, and too often lapses in enrollment. An institution's investment in student mental health is vital for the social, educational, and economic well-being of students, their campuses, and broader society. This investment is the responsibility of the entire campus and should be approached holistically. This policy consists of five components. The first lists the required mental health services that should be provided to students. It includes individual counseling, group counseling, crisis services, alcohol, and other drug education services and consultations. The second and third components speak to a mental health crisis protocol and notification when students are in crisis. The fourth component is in regard to suicidality. It requires the universities to establish guidelines for the prevention of suicide assessment and treatment. The guidelines should include basic knowledge for all relevant counseling staff, a process for assessment and management of suicidality and principles for all assessments. The guidelines should also include criteria for off-campus referrals and a postvention process. The final component requires institutions to develop prevention strategies that promote mental health and wellness for the campus community through programs that focus on promotion, prevention, and intervention services. This policy has been vetted by the campuses as well as legal counsel. And Ms. Dunahoe, that concludes the Academic and Student Affairs Committee items. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if no one requires further clarification, or should I ask if anyone does? I, not a clarification, but I have a comment. I, I, I would like, can I speak? Is that? Yes, you can. Okay, uh, I just wanted to commend Dr. Khan and the, the uh, chief academic officers for what they did with preparing those COVID-19 uh, guidelines that were put out. Uh, from a national perspective, they were spot on, they were timely, they were in fact one of the first ones to really be put forth and uh, I, I was very proud to be a part of, of a system that was really leading the way on the thinking of a, a lot of those issues, so thanks so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Supervisor Clark. Nothing like getting some policy out in two days that normally takes two years, but we have some fantastic, uh, talented people on our campuses that it was, a, it was truly a um, combined effort that uh, with very good intention. So I appreciate that. Any other comments or questions? Uh, to, Supervisor Donahoe, if I could, I just wanted to, to thank Erica Calais for her leadership and development of that policy that you just heard. Uh, she has been working on this uh, for, for a couple of months in partnership with her campus uh, 
uh, colleagues and, and what she has put together is a policy that will truly be life changing on our campuses. And I just wanted to, to thank her because uh, it's not a hard thing. It's, it's a very hard thing to bring uh, disparate parties together to agree on something of this magnitude. And she did a remarkable job on that. I just want to point that out to the board. Yeah, and, and I'd like to echo Dr. Henderson on that amazing job, Ms. Kelly. It's, um, it's something that's desperately needed at our campuses to address the whole mental health issue. So um, I thank you very much for that. I know that Do um, Dr. Egan was very interested in this and very um, um, delighted that this had come to fruition. So I know even though she's not here, she would also echo y'all's sentiments about um, what a great job that was. I, I would also like, <clears throat> excuse me just a second, Ms. Dunahoe. I would also like to thank everyone involved in this. I know it was a, a big task, but y'all came through. Awesome job. Thank you so much. Are there any other comments from the board? If not, I would like to recommend approval of items E1 through E6 and adoption of item eight. As previously mentioned, E7 is informational only and requires no action. May I have a motion and a second? So move. I'll second. Uh, moved by Mr. Murphy, second by... It's, it's, it's Mimi, nothing. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions from the board? Any comments from the, uh, the community? Are there any public comments? Who's handling that, Dr. Henderson? Do we know, Carol, who's handling it? Carol, Carol will handle that in, in coordination with staff. Okay, so if there are none, then we're, we'll just move on. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, Carol, if you would call a roll for a vote. Okay, Mr. Carter? Yes. Thank you. Dr. Clark? Yes. Dr. Condos? Dr. Condos? Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Condos. Uh, is Mr. Crawford there? Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, Ms. Methvin? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Ms. Perkins? Yes. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. And Mr. Salter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Carol, uh, Jim, Carol, I, I, I didn't hear my name called, but I, I joined the meeting, so I'm, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Donahoe. At this time, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Mary, I've got one other on. Okay. I've got to make sure that we say that the motion was approved. The motion was approved. Okay, thank you. And also, is there any other business to come before this committee at this time? All right. If none, then I'll pass it over to athletics. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunno. Mr. Murphy, if you would address items under the athletic committee at this time. Yes, sir. We have two items on the athletic committee that are all consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bruce Janay will provide an overview of the consent items by campus. Bruce? Good morning, Dr. Murphy. And Good morning. Uh, members. Uh, we only have uh, two items. The first one is from McNeese, request for approval of a contract with Casey Cryer, the head women's basketball coach effective April, April 15, 2020, the contract is for a one-year extension. Item F2 from University of Louisiana Monroe requests for approval of a revised athletic company ticket policy. The company ticket policy primarily addresses football games, but also includes company tickets for basketball, baseball, et cetera. The ultimate number of tickets issued will vary upon the number of persons applying for the complimentary tickets. And that's all I have, Mr. Murphy, for consent items. I, I liked it better when you said Dr. Murphy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, here we go. All of these agenda items have been reviewed by staff and are recommended for approval. Of course, if any member has a question or wishes to discuss any of these items, please let me know. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Any comments from the public? 
If no one requires further clarification to the consent agenda items, may I have a motion and a second for approval of items F1 and F2? And I can't see, so I, I, I can't tell no who's, who's voting. This is James Carter, so move. Okay, thank you, James. I'll solve here, I'll second. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the second. We've got a first and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, aye. like sign. Aye. Sorry, you can't do it that way. It has to be a roll call. Oh, roll call. oh okay, okay. Uh, Ms. Carroll, we'll do a roll call. Okay, Mr. Carter? Yes. Dr. Clark? Yes. Dr. Condos? Yes. Mr. Crawford? Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Mr. Kitchen? Yes. Ms. Lodiger? Ms. Methvin? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Perkins? Yes, yes. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Mr. Salter? Yes. The motion it. is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Item F3, uh, we have an update on the COVID-19 impact on athletic scholarships and events. This is a report only and no action that needs to be taken by the board. Mr. Mark, Dr. Marcus Jones has the presentation. Uh, Mr. Murphy, uh, good morning. Chairman Romero, board members, and Dr. Henderson. Uh, Bruce and I have had extensive Zoom meetings with the ADs from the system schools, and it's clear that the financial impact COVID-19 may have on athletic programs in the state could be huge. We thought it important to take a few minutes to paint a picture of what the athletic programs are facing as they struggle to figure out how they will fill holes in their budget. One thing that is abundantly clear from our conversations with them is that the student athletes well being is top priority for them. They're committed to doing everything possible to avoid cutting scholarships and they have a strong desire to grant the extra year of eligibility to spring athletes. Throughout the conversation with them. Uh, these are these two things were always emphasized. Fall sports are another thing that was at the forefront, forefront of the conversation. As you know, there's uncertainty surrounding the fate of football and other fall sports, and there seems to be more questions than answers. What, what, will the football season begin on time? Will spectators be allowed in the stands? Will the number of games played have to be reduced? Those are only a few of the many questions that are still outstanding as ADs are faced with the task of trying to plan their season around, season around so many unknowns. There are, however, a few challenges that are already apparent. On March 26, the NCAA announced that it is slashing distribution it send, distributions it sends to affiliated colleges and universities this year because they lost 700 million by canceling Division I men's basketball tournament. For UL system schools, that amounts to roughly $2.8 million worth of cuts for the 1920 season with the possibility of additional reductions for 2020. On top of the NCAA cuts, athletic directors are faced with, with a possible decrease, decrease in institutional support the cost of providing scholarships for returning seniors who participated, uh, participated in spring sports, a potential decline in student fees if there is a decline in fall enrollment, and possible loss of game guarantees if they are unable to start the season as season scheduled. These are only a few of the many challenges our athletic programs are facing going into the fall. For weeks, the athletic directors have been running scenarios and drafting plans to deal with potential funding issues they face. As for cost saving measures, they're looking at reducing summer school scholarships, uh, placing a limit on the number of hours athletic scholarships will cover beyond full time, freezing unfilled staff positions, reducing travel and modes of traveling, travel and looking into scheduling fewer contests or playing games that are closer to home to reduce cost. At this point, all cost saving measures are on the table. Now, during the finance committee meeting, Edwin will go into a little more detail on the financial hurdles, face, hurdles facing our athletic programs. 
but today we just wanted to give you a brief overview of some of the challenges they are facing. I wanna end by commending our athletic directors for the proactive approach they are taking to deal with the challenging times ahead. And we have two of them on the call today, uh, Greg Burke from NSU and uh, Tommy McClellan from Louisiana Tech to answer any questions that, uh, that you may have. Uh, Dr. Jones, I'm just curious, you said they're, they're um, investigating all these, will they come back to us with their recommendations as they move forward uh, to plan the fall events? Yes, that's, that's the plan. Uh, if I could, Supervisor Donahoe, there are going to be a number of, of operational matters uh, that we'll come forward with for the board that are in the, in the global sense. Of course, uh, ADs make decisions on a daily basis that also impact this as well. And so it'll, it'll be a combination of, of large items that, that the board will approve from a strategic standpoint and then uh, it, giving expectations to these ADs to, to do the appropriate work as well, just to clarify. Thank you. I also would like to thank uh, Tommy McClellan and, and Greg Burke for, for taking time to join us today. Uh, Tommy uh, represents an FBS program, the Football Bowl Series program uh, in athletics. And of course, Greg Burke uh, represents a Football Championship Series program. All of our programs are Division I, and sometimes we use that terminology to, to distinguish them. Uh, but there's also distinctions, uh, distinctions between those two levels as well. Uh, they have both done uh, extraordinary work as, as, as athletic leaders in our system for, for very many, many years. And so thank you both for joining us. And I don't know, Greg, did you or Tommy have uh, uh, some brief comments you'd like to make regarding athletics? I'll start just by saying that I think that whether it's the Louisiana athletic directors and then Tommy would, would speak in my case, the Southland Conference, in his case, Conference USA, we have been on a good number of WebEx, WebEx and, and Zoom meetings, trying to be as proactive as we can, yet at the same time, the phrase of the, the day and the week and the month seems to be the only thing that's un, that the only thing that's certain right now is uncertainty. So we're trying to project scenarios moving forward for which we really don't have all of the information yet. And it's difficult, it's challenging. As Dr. Jones indicated, our number one concern, and I think I, I know I speak for all of us in my conference and Tommy and in the state is, is the student athletes, staying connected to them, being very, very sensitive to their mental health. But at the same time, we're trying to get a handle on how things are going to be a month from now. Summer school, Northwestern State just announced yesterday that all summer school classes are going to be online. So that creates a set of challenges for us. In fact, I've got a, another WebEx meeting at 1.30 today with our academic and compliance staff because for years, like a lot of schools, we've done a, I guess you would call it a freshman orientation program where we bring uh, incoming freshmen in for a summer bridge program. And part of it is to acclimate them to the academic environment. And now the question is for, for some of them, are they really ready for their first college class to be one that's online? So there's just a lot of considerations right now, whether it's, and I know we're talking about finances a lot, but the academic side of it, the, the mental health side of it, these, to, to use the overused word, these are unprecedented times. But I think the best thing that we have going for us is we've got strong leadership on our campuses. Uh, I'll speak for the Southland Conference with Tom Burnett. We have very strong leadership with our commissioner, obviously strong leadership in our Louisiana system. And that's how we're gonna pull it together and get through it. Thank you, thank you Greg. Tommy, did you have a few comments? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Yes, uh, I, again, <clears throat> I, I think that we, we've gotta be mindful of how we, what is our, how can we do our part? And it, that's to me, it's twofold. It's the immediate, uh, what is our part in cost containment and efficiency? And we're doing things, uh, again, on the local level within our own staff 
in our department, but also I think Greg also is a part of a subcommittee that the Southland Conference uh, has put together. And I'm on a subcommittee that Conference USA has put together as it relates to cost containment and, and looking at items such as uh, championship uh, postseason, um, a number of contests, more regionalization, more divisional play. And, uh, and those are not just those two conferences looking at those things. It's across the board in every league. Uh, we've, we've got to do our part. Uh, I think, I, and I would say this broadly, I think the, the, the beauty is that uh, we, we, we know that model. Uh, we've been through that. We understand efficiency and we've continued to do that and we will continue to do it. The other thing about doing our part is maintaining the understanding that when we do begin to come back, that athletics plays a vital role on our campus that you cannot get from an online experience. And that there's gonna be a time where that's part of the student experience. It's not now, we've gotta do our part now financially, but there's gonna be a part later in which we're gonna be a part of the recovery effort and the, the recruitment effort to all of our campuses. And so we've gotta be mindful of both, but uh, it was that I will commend Marcus and Bruce for putting us together. It's the first time uh, that I've been an AD uh, in this league at, with two different institutions in the ULS system um, that we've had that type of collaboration. So I commend them for doing that. And quite frankly, probably recommend that we do that just occasionally because uh, it, I thought it was very productive. We are all very diverse and we have different objectives, uh, but we're all very tied together. And so I commend them for doing that. Well, Tommy, I appreciate you saying that. And just for our board members edification, uh, you know, Greg uh, mentioned Southland Conference and many of our schools are in the Southland Conference. Uh, Tommy and Louisiana Tech are in Conference USA. Uh, Brian Maggard at UL Lafayette and Scott McDonald at UL Monroe represent us very well in the Sunbelt Conference. And of course, Rusty Ponton from, uh, from Grambling uh, does a, a wonderful job in, in, in the SWAC, Southwest Athletic Conference. Uh, and so those conferences are just another aspect that, that kind of complicates uh, our structure as a system, to system structure. We have a Louisiana structure. Uh, we have conferences. We have bowl divisions. Uh, and so there's a lot of layers to this. And, and at every layer, we have some extraordinarily effective voices and leadership working. And, and, and to, uh, to these two, Tom McClellan and Greg Burke, and, and by extension, the seven ADs that they're representing, I uh, just want to thank them for their leadership. They do amazing work. And uh, if you look at the success of student athletes across our system, it's reflected in their leadership. And so thank you both very much for joining us. Uh, unless there are questions from board members, Marcus, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, I think that that is it for, uh, for us. So we'll turn it back over to, to Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Dr. Jones. And thank you so much for your hard work. Thank you, gentlemen. And y'all uh, stay at it and we hope to have a great year. Um, okay, uh, do we have any other business at this time? If not, that concludes the business of the athletic committee. Next committee is facilities planning. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. At this time, I'll ask Mr. Perkins to proceed with that agenda. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have five items on the facilities and planning committee at all consent agenda. Mr. Bruce Janay, will you please uh, provide an overview of the consent items by campus? Yes, sir, Mr. Perkins. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, item G1 is from Nichols. Approval to sell the Dewey Building that is located on Civic Center Boulevard in Homa. In 2018, the university leased a large portion of the building to the Stork Corporation with approval of the board. The Stork Corporation's mission is to promote opportunities that enhance self-sufficiency of citizens who are impaired in their ability to live and function independently. Stork Corporation was trying to seek additional space in Homa. Therefore, Nichols des desires to sell this to, to a specific buyer at the appraised value of $2 million. Board policy does allow sale to a specific buyer if approved by a legislative act. A bill has been filed recently by Representative Jerome Zerain. It's House Bill 830 to allow for this sale. The university is also requesting to retain the funds from the sale in accordance with board policy. The sale proceeds derived from this event will be placed in a restricted fund to allow development of spaces and buildings on campus to provide enhancements focused on student achievement and success. 
use of these funds will permit the projects to be undertaken without borrowing from the facility corporation or seeking future capital outlay funding. Item G2 is from Southeastern. Approval to enter into a ground lease agreement with the Lions Athletic Association to replace the artificial turf at the football field at Strawberry Stadium. The turf is over 10 years old and there have been some issues experienced as a result of its age. So therefore the university wants to maintain the integrity of the playing surface and to ensure the safety of student athletes. The Lions Athletic Association will fund the necessary improvements to install new turf in time for the 2020 football season. Uh, and uh, even if it's delayed, the cost of the project is approximately 750,000. And once the project is completed, the Athletic Association will donate the turf back to the university. <clears throat> Item G3, University of Louisiana Lafayette, Approval to demolish two Billy Odd construction building, greenhouse buildings that are poured uh, to make way for a new seating park plaza for students. Both structures were built in 1958 and cost to demo is approximately $5,000, which will be funded out of a dedicated student fee. Items G4 and G5 are from the U University of Louisiana Monroe approval to name the ULM Child Development Center in memory of Emily Williamson Laboratory School and to name the financial aid suite inside a sandal hall to the Dr. Charles or McDonald financial aid suite. These two requests are in accordance with the board rule on naming. And that is all of the consent items, Mr. Perkins. Okay. All these uh, agenda items have been reviewed by staff and are recommended for approval. Of course, if any member has any question or wishes to discuss any of these items, please let me know. Uh, uh, yes. Oh. Quick question Dr. on, on uh, I think it was G3. Uh, Bruce, you mentioned that the funding, the $5,000, I think comes out of a student fee, dedicated student fee. Is that an existing fee? Yes, yes. And, and uh, is the existing fee it was um hang on i have when it was passed it was an existing fee that was passed in 2012 and it equates to about uh 200 per student per year and this is the fund that they use anytime they want to do student improvement projects so it is no additional cost to the student at this time thank you welcome any other questions from any other board members? Uh, any comments from the public? We have none, Mr. Perkins. Okay, thank you. If no one requires any further clarification of the consent agenda, agenda items, may I have a motion in the second for approval items G1 through G5? So moved. Uh, most, um, motion by Mr. Murphy and a second by, couldn't hear the voice, the second voice. James. Uh, by Mr. C by Dr. Carter. Um, are, uh, can we have a roll call vote, Ms. Carroll, please? To accept. Mr. Carter. Yes. yes. Dr. Clark. Yes. Dr. Condos. Yes. Ms. Donahoe. Yes. Mr. Kitchen. Yes. Ms. Lodiger? Ms. Muffin? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Ms. Perkins? Yes. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. Mr. Salter? Yes. Yes. The motion is approved. Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Do we have any other business uh, at this time for the facilities and planning committee? If not, that concludes the business of the Facilities and Planning Committee. Uh, next committee is finance. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. And at this time, Mr. Kitchen will address items under the Finance Committee. Thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, finance Committee, <clears throat> we have uh, six consent items on the agenda today. 
Um, any member has a question or wishes to discuss any of the items, please let me know. Uh, Edwin, will you walk us through uh, an overview of each item? Yes, sir. Good morning, board members, Mr. President. Uh, the first item is Louisiana Tech University's request for approval to increase the contract rate for students enrolled at the Barksdale Air Force Base effective summer quarter 2020. Uh, this is a agreement, a memorandum of understanding that Louisiana Tech with, has with the Department of Defense. Uh, a number of years ago, I believe in 2014, uh, they created their first memorandum of understanding. And the Department of Defense had created some <laughs> guidelines on the maximum amount uh, that they would uh, reimburse students enrolled in programs. And so Louisiana Tech is requesting approval to go from $208 per credit hour to $214 per credit hour for the summer quarter. Uh, so a $6 increase per credit hour. Uh, but if you think about it from the standpoint of uh, that cost to the student at Barksdale, they really get uh, the best deal that we have in the UL system for that. Item two is Northwestern State University's request for approval to establish a nurse beneficence fee. Uh, this fee will be $3,650 per semester. Uh, it'll be for nine semesters for three years. Uh, the total cost will be $74,976. Uh, this tuition uh, is very comparable competitively with other institutions. Uh, the LSU program is $75,600. Uh, the University of Southern Miss is $75,700. The University of Alabama is $80,000. And the average uh, programs in the region in the South is about $88,000. Uh, when you look at the salary ranges of what students will get when they come out of this program, uh, for instance, in Baton Rouge, uh, you can start out at $153,000 a year. Uh, the ranges are between 120 and 200,000 plus. Uh, so you can see that for the cost of the program, uh, the benefit in the salary is a long-term uh, potential there. Uh, Edwin, that 75,000 is the tuition and fees for three years. That is correct. correct. Okay. Yes, sir. And, and if, I could, if I could interrupt just re real quickly, it's, it's not really a finance comment, it's, but, it, but it's related to that. This, uh, this program is an extraordinary advance for the entire system. Of course, it's at Northwestern State. Uh, but Dana Clausen, who has been the dean of the College of Nursing and School of, of Allied Health at Northwestern, has done a remarkable job putting this program together, recruiting great faculty, and recruiting uh, a, a tremendous program director. Uh, to lead this program, it will be one that will make us proud for quite some time. The reason that we're able to offer this program at, uh, uh, at a lower amount than the average is because of her legwork and that of, uh, of their team. And of course, uh, Dr. Maggio and, and obtaining funding from private resources who will be taken, who, who will benefit from this program. Uh, but it is certainly, a, it should be a source of pride for this whole system. Thank you for that. And, uh, and I would also like to uh, mention that most of the students coming into this program uh, are already nurses. Many of them um, have been working. So they're not the traditional student that is struggling to pay their, uh, they have pretty good salaries to begin with. So I don't think it'll be quite the burden it might be if these were uh, students that didn't have a job. So um, not that that was a consideration. <clears throat> Hey, the, uh, these are, um, you know, the professors in this area uh, are, are very advanced, obviously, and so they're going to require a greater salary. So that was one of the reasons for the cost. But uh, these students, I think, have the ability to pay this without a big burden. I agree. All right, we'll move on to item three, <clears throat> is the University of Louisiana Systems request for approval of endowed professorships, endowed first generation scholarships. Uh, we have five scholarships and endowed professorships from Grambling State University. We have four from Louisiana Tech University and the University of Louisiana Lafayette is requesting to 
uh, rename the Chuck and Sue Lean Endowed Professorship in Music uh, to change it to the, or to music from the Endowed Professorship in Management. Item H4 is the University of New Orleans request for approval to refund the series 2014 bonds uh, from the University of New Orleans Research and Technology Foundation, the student housing project. Uh, this will be a refunding of approximately $30 million. Uh, expect to have it about a 3% net present value savings for approximately $60,000 per year. Uh, this is the initial um, approval that UNO will need to go forward. Uh, and the same as with the, I think it was the six bonds that we approved for refunding in February. Uh, with the markets the way they are, uh, the financial advisors and the bond attorneys will uh, be looking for when is the right opportunity for us to be able to do that. But having this approval will give them the opportunity to uh, refund those bonds when it's at the most beneficial uh, time period for the institution. Edwin, on the uh, refunding issues that we approved at the February meeting, um, <clears throat> I believe those had been approved by the Bond Commission? Yes, sir. Those went to the Bond Commission last week. Uh, so they've had that uh, approval. And so now they will be waiting for uh, the right uh, time and, and the markets in order to do those refundings on those. Okay. The next item is item H5. It's the University of Louisiana Systems recommendation to approve campus housing and meal plan rates uh, and energy surcharge and the non-governmental charges for academic year 2020. Uh, this is a routine item that we do every year in April. Uh, most of the changes in housing and meal plan rates are tied to contractual obligations that they have with their food service providers and with the housing uh, de departments. Uh, as you can see, there's some institutions because of the, the situations have not gone up on their rates this year. Uh, and if you see for the most part, uh, the increases are usually uh, tied to the consumer price index, usually around three to 4%, under 5%. Uh, the one thing about the housing and meal plan rates is the institutions are very aware of the market rates. And so they have to be very concerned that they don't go up and allow it to be cheaper for a student to go off campus or stay at home. So they're very, very aware and cognizant of the impact of these increases. And they do their best to try to keep these rates as low as possible in order to, to make those work. Uh, you'll also have energy surcharges uh, that uh, we approve each year at this time. And then we also have other fees um, that are usually more of the lab fees or course fees that come in throughout the year uh, for those approvals. Question? Yes, sir. Uh, on the campus uh, meal plan, housing meal plan rates and so on, it, it, I'm not familiar enough with the, the, the details. Does the potential for a decrease in uh, student housing in the fall uh, impact or affect potentially the rate structure? Um, it, it, it will. In fact, if you notice, the University of Louisiana Lafayette does not have their meal plan rates because part of their what they're working on is, is negotiating uh, that closure in the spring and then into summer and fall. Uh, so at a later point, we'll get the University of Louisiana Lafayette's uh, meal plan rates to, for approval. So I think it's very much right now, um, we've had a number of institutions that have uh, discussed or talked about uh, reducing rates for the summer. Uh, so I think the, the most important thing that I think everybody's looking at is enrollment. How do we uh, maximize our enrollment, stabilize the enrollment. And in some cases, that's going to be uh, scholarships, uh, tuition, housing, and meal plans. So I think as we uh, come out of the quarantine time period, uh, there's a lot of fluidity that we're going to have to go through in order to do that. So I, I think, yes, they're absolutely looking at uh, how do we structure this to provide the maximum enrollment that we can. So is there flexibility 
Edwin, in, in terms of these, I mean, our approval of these mm -hmm. plan rates, if there is an impact on, on enrollment or participation, uh, access to you know physical facilities uh, in the fall, are we tied into anything here or is there flexibility built in so that we can make an adjustment? Well, what would happen is, because a lot of these are contractually re related. So it's built into those contracts that they would go up the CPI. So if something changes and they have to adjust these, the institutions would have to go back and negotiate with the vendors and determine what the rates are, uh, what the concessions are, and then they would need to come back uh, and uh, adjust those rates. So they have the flexibility to do it. I think it's a little bit more involved than just deciding that we're gonna change this by a, a certain amount because you have the, the third party that you have to work with in order to make it uh, agreeable to both. Okay, so the, the, the timing of this approval is important now rather than when there's more certainty. Uh, and again, not knowing and understanding. It sounds like we're approving something for the entire year and yet listening just to the athletic directors and the uncertainty of so much, are, are we doing anything potentially at, you know, adverse to the institution's interests uh, by, by approving something now, locking things in, or is this a good move from your vantage point to set and establish something now so that there is, is some certainty going forward? I think one of the biggest challenges the institutions have right now is, is setting the rate structures up as students are now applying and getting ready to go to orientation uh, and registering in the summer. And so I think one of the challenges that you have is if you delay this too long, uh, you're not able to provide that competitive uh, structure that you can offer to students uh, in housing, meal plans, scholarships, uh, housing scholarships, uh, meal plan scholarships. So I think it's part of the whole package. And I think the challenge is, is getting it out there in enough time that, that parents and families will know what they're going to have to pay as they decide on where they're going to go to college in the fall. Okay. And like I said, the opportunity is there for them to come back and make adjustments as necessary, just like we did in the spring when we had to refund the students. Thank you. And then item six, the University of Louisiana's report of internal and external audit activity for the period of February through April. Uh, Bruce Janay is gonna cover that one. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Edwin. Uh, item eight six is University of Louisiana system report on internal and external audit activity for the period of February 24th to April 19th, 2020. Each board member was sent a copy of the summary I've also included internal audits that are currently in progress and a timetable for follow-up audits. Uh, at this time as well, I would like to present a recap of the Legislative Auditor's 2019 findings. <clears throat> um, each of you should have received the initial release of the various reports, which included the findings, <laughs> management response, and corrective action plans. When all reports are issued, I normally prepare a recap of all the reportable findings and I send them to all the internal audit directors and the CFOs. Then we ask them to test at their university for similar conditions and if found to implement preventative measures. At Northwestern, some of the faculty, unclassified and classified employees and their supervisor did not, did not certify their employees time work as required by state civil service policy if they're classified and also system policy. An example that the legislative archers conducted a sample of 25 employees, two did not certify time and 10 supervisors did not approve. And then the legislative archer ran some other reports and found out through, throughout the year that this appeared to be a systemic problem. At, at, uh, at uh, Southeastern, that they, didn't have, they did not have a process in place to determine if students were eligible to receive student financial assisting, resulting in non-compliance with federal regulations for some students. 
Also, Southeastern did not actually report construction costs for their computer science and technology building, which caused an overstatement of the building. This occurred because uh, Southeastern was not reconciling the net payments that they received or recorded from Office of Facility Planning and Construction progress reports for the building as of June 30th, 18. The legislative auctions proposed a prior period adjustment that was accepted by the university. Also, Southeastern submitted inaccurate loan program information when they prepared their schedule of expenditures of federal awards. The university did not properly compile and review the report, the uh, the uh, information before submitting it to the Office of Statewide Reporting and Accounting Policy for inclusion in the state's single audit report. <clears throat> Finally, University of Louisiana and Lafayette, we had two findings there. The university granted 46 employees inappropriate access to their banner accounting system. In addition, access to banner was not terminated in a timely manner when 29 employees left university employment. The second finding was that the university had failed to notify the legislative auditor and the Lafayette Parish District Attorney of two instances of employee misappropriation as required by law. One involved travel and another use of a state credit card. The suspected misappropriations totaled approximately $3,000 and they were identified by UL Lafayette through in-house investigations. As a result, both employees were terminated and the total amount of the misappropriation was recouped from the two employees. And uh, several of our schools did not have any findings. And of course, I had talked about the UL system report, with, which we didn't have any findings in that one. We also received a clean opinion. We, uh, Bruce, you know, which is the best one you can receive. Bruce, a couple of questions. On the ULL, the, the, um, uh, the incident where they uh, failed to notify the Louisiana Legislative Auditor and the Lafayette Parish District Attorney of the two uh, misappropriations, I'm just, how, how were those items, those two instances discovered? Uh, discovered by university police. And uh, apparently they didn't have a, a a system in place that that either when the internal auditor finds a, a misappropriation or another unit <clears throat> that uh, they are not notified. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> excuse me, apparently university police conducted these two investigations, but it did not flow all the way up to management so that they could report it. Um. I mean, what, what gave rise to the university police to even follow up on these two? The reason why I'm saying is, how do we know there are only two? That was only two cases that they, you know, found and noted. And, you know, legislative altar is very, very thorough whenever mm -hmm. they test for this area. Okay. Maybe, maybe just as a follow up, just circle back and uh, ask to see if there was any other. Uh, audit procedures done to give us some assurance that we're just dealing with two instances like this. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Kitchen and Bruce, if I could interrupt, uh, you know, each can, uh, university and each budget subsidiary in the state has to do an annual property inventory. And typically it's during that inventory process is when a missing piece will arise and a report is done. This finding is really less about the property itself and more about the following the process when something is a when, a, when that is identified, you have to report it to different areas. But they have, uh, sure. Bruce, and Bruce checks this quite diligently, uh, the property inventories is a major component of the audit process uh, for all of our institutions. I hope, hope that helps some. Yeah, no, I, I'm not, um, you know, disturbed by uh, the $3,000. It's just, you know, we would just want to make sure that we've got a system and a process to, uh, first of all, prevent something like this from occurring. And secondly, then when we do learn of it, we do follow it up thoroughly to make sure that what we are you know, aware of is, is really the extent of the problem. So that's, that, that's all. Um, I'll, be glad, yeah. uh, I'll be glad to get back to the university on it. Sure. And, and then the, the other thing you might do you <clears throat> mentioned with regard to South um, Eastern, the, um, the process, there was no process in place to determine if the students were eligible to receive the financial assistance 
uh, two things. Uh, uh, you know, t today there is a process in place. I guess that there is corrective action taken. Uh, well, well, they are working on it. Uh, the you know the 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 university is waiting on guidance from the Department of Education. The financial director, the financial aid uh, director was terminated. I think that they're using a loan, a loan servicing process. So they have instituted many, many corrective action steps. And this goes back to uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, knowing Dr. Crane and Sam Damiano, who is a chief financial officer, uh, I am pretty comfortable that the corrective action that they plan to take it will be corrected because there was a number of internal controls that wasn't in place. I think they had trouble with the system that kept track of the loans, et cetera. So they have gone in and done a thorough investigation to sort out all of the internal control issues <clears throat> to, to get them fixed. And I know, I know they're working on it now because life slave archers will go back and do a follow up on it. And, Dr. Crane is, you know, very against having a repeat finding. So he has entrusted Sam and staff to, to uh, take care of it. Well, okay. And you also might uh, mention the dollar amount, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, yes, sir. um, approximately, I think it was 94 students, uh, totaling approximately, um, a half a million dollars, re, you know, end up receiving above, um, above the limit. So what the student has to do, and that's what Southeastern is working on, the student goes back and applies for another certification. It's sort of like a bank loan, that if you have a certain dollar amount that you're limited, but the student can apply to get a reaffirmation and get that amount increased. And of course it has to be paid back uh, after graduation. Mr. Kitchen, I think the, the key component for Southeastern is hiring the director of financial aid, and they're currently in the process of that. And I think the expectation is that they will have one uh, very soon uh, that will have the experience and the ability to come in and ensure that the controls are in place to monitor that and make sure that it doesn't happen. Okay. And, and, and the other thing, I guess, with regard to Southeastern, uh, this $18.6 million overstatement in the building, you know, as I understand it, um, the, uh, the amount uh, of cost that related to the building to be recorded was given to the university by the Office of Facilities. Maybe you can help clarify a little bit there. It's, it seems to me for the auditors to include that in their report seemed to be uh, a bit of a stretch. Um, it, uh, Sounded like they expected the people in the accounting staff to be uh, more of an engineer rather than an accountant. So but no, um, I, I I am pretty sure that they had you know that they had supplied the proper uh, information, and I think it was a breakdown in control of taking that because I think they had I think it was two hundred million dollars total, and then trying to reconcile that, which is a daunting task. I think the amount, if I'm not mistaken, Edwin can correct me, I think it was doubled, you know, that they put the building in at 30 something million. Uh, but they recorded it based on what they were told. Uh, this is Charles Went. Can I make a, a comment on that, uh, Mr. Kitchen? Sure. Okay. Um, my understanding of what happened is, is that the building was originally um, set up at a cost of about uh, I want to say uh, the upper 20s, and they ended up capitalizing an additional 18 million. But what happened is, is the reports that come from facility planning had an error in the report uh, for the ongoing construction and progress. And the university uh, did not identify that. The university actually identified it, but they identified it subsequent to its original capitalization at 43 million and they had gone back uh, and they found found that error because facility planning had made some changes to their report. I understand. Okay. <clears throat> Bruce, anything else to report? No, sir. 
Okay. Uh, any other uh, questions, comments I, from the board? I, let me just ask, and I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but going back to the ULL uh, uh, problem, um, Bruce, can you remind, you, you probably had this in the report, but who, who is it exactly that has the responsibility of reporting uh, these incidents to the legislative auditor and or the district attorney? Um, I would say that it's management within a finance section, that management should have a process in place that all instances of misappropriation are reported to them so that they can include it in their financial letter of representation. So I, I would say that the finance side is charged with that. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that they have notified all of the different uh, departments and reminded them of their responsibility to report it so they can do, do the proper notification. In fact, in fact, normally the letter would come from the president and a copy would come to me and also to the district attorney. So uh, it would be written by the president but the fiscal staff are the ones that should be checking and, and uh, monitoring it. So when they did a review of what went wrong in this situation, they didn't find any need to clarify their procedures or uh, they just needed to be reminded whose responsibility it was? Correct, correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments from the board? Any comments from the public? If not, uh, may I have a motion and second for approval, approval of the consent items? So moved. Okay, second. Ms. Lola Donahue uh, moves and seconded by? Ms. Pierre, a second. Uh, Liz Pierre, thank you. So um, I, I would hope maybe uh, Carol, you'll have a roll call to, uh, mm -hmm. to approve the uh, consent items. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Carter. Yes. Dr. Clark? Yes. Dr. Condos? Yes. Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Mr. Kitchen? Yes. Ms. Rachel Lodiger? Yes. Ms. Methvin? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Perkins? Yeah, yes. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. And Mr. Joe Salter. Yes. The motion's approved. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> right now, the next item would be a, a presentation on the uh, item number seven by Dr. Henderson, which would be an update on the financial impact in the CARES Act, which is uh, recent legislation in response to the pandemic. Um, and Jim, do you want to cover this now, or would you rather keep this and maybe cover it in your remarks near the end? Uh, Mr. Kitchen, I will talk in a broader sense about the COVID-19 impacts. This is very much a finance uh, okay. presentation. It's, it's actually a team approach. Kami is, Geisman is going to talk a little bit about some of the work we've done. And then I really wanted uh, uh, Edwin and his team and Marcus to, uh, to go through some of the financial impacts. And then we'll talk later in my report, if that's okay with you. Sure thing. All right. I'll turn it over to you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, and, and Cam, if you will get us started on the, uh, the timeline piece, because you were instrumental in putting all of this together. She's speechless <laughs> for the first time. Jim, you, you're waiting on whom now? This is Cami Geisman. Dr. Okay. Henderson, she is coming. We are having slight technical difficulty, but give us just a second. Okay, thank you. This is our stretch break. <laughs> well, Jim, let me ask you this. Is, is there anything in your experience in education that's prepared you for an experience like what we're going through. Uh, yes, sir. You know, it's uh, it's 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 a great way to ask the question, and I and I talked a little bit about this uh, 
to, to staff and, and I was standing in my backyard in uh, mid-September of 2005. I had been on uh, the job at Louisiana Community Technical College System as their uh, executive VP for about uh, 90 days. And uh, this was between Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita. And we know about the, the, the devastation that ca was caused by both of those storms. And I got a phone call from uh, Walter Bumpus, who was the president of LCTCS now then, and is now president of American Association of Community Colleges. And he says, uh, James, we need a plan. And that was the direction I got. And so we, we hung up the phone <laughs> and uh, went through a series of, of, of meetings with various uh, stakeholder groups. And this is, this is the key. You've got a number of moving parts moving in different directions, but hopefully to the ultimate, ultimately the same goal. And you have to uh, uh, figure out how to, to bring these groups together without restricting thinking, without restricting activity, certainly without restricting uh, uh, deliveries, and yet <clears throat> try to keep them in at least in the same framework moving forward. And so, uh, so I would say that that, uh, that circumstance had a lot of similarities, not nearly the scope and breadth of this one. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, the nine university presidents that we have, uh, their teams, uh, the staff we have at the system office, and then our partners, uh, our commissioner of higher education, and, and of course, we have uh, a governor who, whenever he was created, whenever he was thought of, uh, the maker must have thought, we need someone who can handle a crisis. And that's who we've got at, at the governor's office. So with well, all of those pieces in, in place, uh, I, I think that that more than compensates from the lack of experience that anybody has in dealing with a pandemic of this size. So I hope that's fair. And we'll go a little bit more when my report, I know Cammy has, has indicated uh, that she's back. Uh, I, hey, Cammy. <laughs> I, I, I am so sorry. I did come to the office to uh, prevent a toddler Zoom boom <laughs> or, or Zoom bomb. And then as soon as y'all call on me, my computer died because of course my charger is at my home where I've been working. So, but I'm on my iPad now. So uh, my apologies and great stalling. Um, who, Mr. Kitchen and uh, Dr. Henderson. I appreciate that. So um, as you've heard from my colleagues, uh, the system has spent the, the past seven weeks providing guidance and, and counsel uh, to, as our um, member institutions respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, with this guidance, our institutions have completed, or have completed the Herculean task of moving operations online um, but this timeline doesn't uh, adequately capture the time spent on phone calls, uh, exchanging emails and engaging in Zoom meetings like this. Um, it also doesn't reflect the reporting work done by our institutions um, and, and the system to report on housing technology disparities, uh, food service and other areas to provide status updates to the governor's office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, the Board of Regents and other stakeholders throughout this event as well as conversations with le the legislature, um, members of the legislature and um, uh, congressional staff. Um, all this work has resulted in our ability to assess and develop policies to reduce the burden of this event on our faculty, staff and students. And looking back on the past month and a half to develop this timeline was almost therapeutic uh, to see all of our member, to see all the work our, our member institutions have done and um, what they've accomplished despite the circumstances. So what you see in front of you is it, it's the tip of the iceberg, but really the highlights of what, what we've been able to accomplish the past uh, month and a half. So on March 4th, the system distributed uh, COVID-19 guidelines wow. on travel, distance education, communication policies, hygiene and safety. A few days later, we had a meeting with the presidents where we were supposed to be discussing our legislative package as it was the first day of um, the session and we wanted to talk about priorities, but that quickly transitioned into a meeting um, about the pandemic and COVID-19. Um, I look back on, do on Dr. Nicholas sitting in that room and he being the one who had who had felt the impact the most to date and, and it was really um, a time of, of warning for the other eight presidents and for our staff to see what he was already experiencing and um, what was to come for us. Um, March 13th, we up updated those guidelines to include uh, guidance to suspend in-person classes after March 16th, as well as to ensure a supportive environment for the students, faculty, and staff, especially those at-risk populations. And then um, we also provided guidelines for human resources, anticipating a drastic, a drastic shift in operations. 
Um, and of course that quickly turned into a work from home order. Um, we've updated the legislature twice um, with a very comprehensive update, but we've also had individual conversations. Uh, we hopped on a call with um, the um, Senate Education Committee that uh, Senator Fields had invited the rest of the, um, the members to join where they were able to ask questions. Um, on March 26, we distributed academic guidelines focused on student-friendly policies to ensure success during this disrupted semester. And um, Dr. Khan did uh, touch on that. On April, 4, April 8th, we re uh, released faculty guidelines addressing tenure extensions and other matters relevant to faculty, which Dr. Khan touched on. Uh, April 8th, we also provided an overview documents for student provisions provided through the CARES Act, as well as adjustments to TOPS through the uh, governor's exec executive order. And um, that was just to um, have um, a concise message for our universities to share with students. And then on April 14th, we provided guidance on the distribu distribution of student grant funds provided for through the CARES Act. So I think um, uh, Char Charles is gonna, and Edwin are gonna go more into what that guidance and what the CARES Act um, does for our institutions. But that is kind of a quick and dirty overview of what we've done the past few weeks. And I'm happy to answer any questions or as well as our staff on the line. Amy, thank you very much for that. And that was just to, uh, uh, just to give you an idea of, of the magnitude of this work uh, and, and then allow uh, Marcus and Edwin and Charles and, and Bruce and whomever else is on your team, uh, maybe it's Edwin. And I, I keep thinking if I look at someone's picture on this screen that they know I'm looking at them and not looking at the camera. So I apologize for that, uh, making eye contact. But, uh, but it, they wanted to do a deeper dive into the financials and really give you an idea of some of the questions that we're asking uh, because uh, th there aren't a lot of answers out there. There are a ton of questions, questions that we know, and then there's questions that we don't know yet. Uh, but we'll go through this, and, and then uh, I believe the chairman will have uh, uh, some comments later in the meeting to talk about an approach that we have to ensure the board is engaged as we go forward. So, uh, Edwin, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, sir. I think our biggest challenge we have today is just trying to get our hands around where we're at and unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna know that for a period of time. It's gonna take some time for us to see what the impact of uh, shutting down the economy does for, for two months, uh, the impact of enrollment. Uh, Dr. Henderson sent out an article last week that looked at uh, what ACE had predicted. ACE had predicted that there's a potential of 15% loss in students, uh, particularly potential 25% loss in international students. Uh, so we're gonna kind of run through uh, some of what we've looked at, some of what we've modeled, uh, and there's so much involved in it that uh, it's, it's so preliminary uh, at this point, but I think it gives you some insight into how deep we're going and, and when we get to that point where we'll, we'll be in a better situation. Charles? Um, I just want to make a couple of introductory comments relative to what has been going on, but obviously the national shutdown has really impacted our universities and they're facing a number of unprecedented challenges and those challenges continue to evolve in part because as the as the shutdown extends or continues, then the data we look at and and uh, how we address our students changes, but also with the CARES Act, uh, guidance is coming up almost continually on that. And was it yesterday, Dr. Henderson, or the day before that there was new guidance on the CARES Act? Uh, it, it came I out. Think, it came out yesterday, and I, there were some news that came out across uh, from the Department of Education, uh, indicating that schools were not responding quickly enough to uh, obtain the funding. Our schools were amongst the first to respond and amongst the first to receive the funding. And then uh, just this week, they changed the criteria. So we'll, we'll continue to, to work through that with our, our chief financial officers, our financial aid directors, and of course our university presidents to get that funding where it needs to be as quickly as possible. Charlie. And, and as an, a, a former auditor and as an accountant, one of the things that does concern me is how those uh, requirements for these programs change 
while you're in progress as opposed to programs that have been established and you have a, a, set, uh, a set of standards that you follow up front. But our financial operations and athletics face significant challenges and you've already seen some of the athletic uh, concerns that they're having. And so in the following, we're gonna address uh, some of the financial as well as just uh, a little bit of the, of the athletic as well. But keep in mind that the information here is based uh, on estimates, but also some speculation from the standpoint of, of looking at different scenarios that could occur, but also uh, because we have such a fluid environment right now, uh, the best you can uh, do is to a great extent speculate. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Edwin. And, and we'll just make a point. We all saw Monday uh, what happens to those who speculate. Uh, when you've bought oil and you have nowhere to put it and you have the paper, uh, eventually you have to take the oil. And if you don't have a storage facility, then you have to sell that oil at, uh, at, the, at the least loss you can. So speculation can be dangerous, uh, but this is really informed speculation in my opinion. So Edwin. So this, this is where we were at the beginning of the year, uh, total system operating budget, fees and self-generated revenue and state funds uh, were a little over $900 million in the operating budget. Our state funds are $240 million. That includes the self fund, which is for faculty salaries, which is tied to the casino revenue. Uh, so we've been getting a lot of calls, how much are we gonna lose on the self funds? and uh, at this point, uh, we're, we're still waiting to see what, what that impact is going to be. So we know that there's going to be an impact on the self funds for this year. Uh, and then on the state funds, I, I saw um, where Lauren Scott had done a, he said a back of the envelope calculation uh, a week ago uh, that he had impacted with everything that had happened about a 400, just a rough ballpark, $400 million uh loss for the state uh, and then working with Jim Richardson looking at the um, uh, rainy day fund or the surplus uh, he, he was estimating that we would take about a 200 million dollar cut this year for the state uh, so what's going to be the impact on higher education and uh, health health care when it comes to that so we wanted to give you the idea of what the 240 is going to look at and then Charles is going to kind of give you an idea of what we're paying on the U UAL. Uh, as you're aware, and we've talked before on the UAL, that is the system's allocated portion of payments toward the unfunded actuarial accrued liability for our pension plans. And right now we're showing uh, for operating that the, the unfunded portion, our payments toward that rather, are about $92.4 million. Uh, keep in mind that that number is actually larger. We, we're paying about $121 million this year toward those numbers. And part of the reason uh, those other parts are in our restricted and auxiliary funds. And so they, there is some of the other areas there. But one of the issues with the UAL is the fact that the state is constitutionally bound to provide the uh, pension benefit to the former employees, retirees. And what happened with an accounting standard is, is that these funds are, these portions of these liabilities are now allocated to the entities participating in those plans and they end up on our financial statements. But in reality, the state of Louisiana actually has the liability to ensure that these payments are made. If the UL system suddenly did not exist, the state would still have the liability to provide those benefits to employees. And I'm not trying to say that we're not going to exist. I just wanted to use that as a quick example. So if you have questions about the UAL, please feel free to ask. So, uh, the federal government Excuse me, I, I want to go back to Charles' comment. Uh, okay. Uh, you might, well, 92 million is the, what I'll say, part of the uh, annual contribution we make. 
the um, unfunded accrued liability total is how much? Could you approximate that? Uh, as it relates to the, to the system on the system's financial statements, uh, we've got approximately $1 billion right. uh, in liabilities that have been recorded on our financial statements. Uh, that was the liability as of June 30, 2019, approximately right. a billion. And I believe that the, I, I can look up the number if you'd like, but I believe that the pension fund statewide at that point was funded at about, uh, was uh, about 65% or so funded. Correct. Of course, this year's stock market uh, losses won't be reflected in our financial statements until the uh, 2021 fiscal year's financial statements. So we won't see that hit for another uh, year. And so we don't know what the long-term effect on that liability is because obviously what happens is as the state's liability goes up, it's gonna hit our financial statements and then we're gonna, you know, our, our liability will increase. Well, I just wanted to point out that the unfunded accrued liability is much larger, uh, or at least the, the <coughs> end for the future payments at some point is much larger than the 92 million. It, right. it, Mr. Chairman, if I could though, I, I, will, I will point out that the, the 92 million uh, does not include the normal cost that we pay for existing yeah. employees, right? So this, yeah. this is, yeah. this is yeah. legacy. It's also only the portion that comes from the operating budget. There's another uh, $29 million that we pay that comes uh, from non-operating revenues. So it's a total of $121 million that our system pays uh, just to retire the legacy UAL. Right. Uh, year 2027, the legacy payments, this amount that you see here uh, is done. If, if, if things stay on path and the financial returns are what they are, then we will have retired the legacy portion of the UAL. This is something that's going to be important for us to look at because that 2027 date is a statutory date. And as the state deals with financial challenges, uh, uh, rather than uh, if, if and we have to make reductions, rather than impact the faculty and students who will be our future, I'm hoping that we can take some considerations into remediating the state's lack of funding from the past. In other words, making uh, this 2027 date, which is somewhat arbitrary, uh, may not be as high a priority as ensuring we're developing talent, we're recruiting and developing and retaining faculty. Uh, this is a number that has nothing to do with the students that we currently serve, it has nothing to do with the faculty we currently have employed. This is remediating a problem that the state had three decades ago. And, uh, and so I continue to put this number out there because this is a liability of the state of Louisiana. And I'm, I point this out to our legislative auditors every year in the exit conference that we carry this liability on, our, on the books of colleges and universities. And we essentially make students pay to retire this debt but the debt is actually a liability of the state. And it's something that we're gonna to continue to work with uh, with our partners at the state and with the legislature to ensure that we, we keep this, because it's very important, right? It's important that we retire this. It's important we keep our pension programs at a healthy level. And, and uh, but it's also something we keep them uh, uh, in, in context with the priorities, the broader priorities of the state as well. Right, okay. Well, Charles, continue, please. Well, and, and I'll just follow up with, with uh, Dr. Henderson's comments, uh, including normal cost, our, our total pension payments are going to be about 141 million for the year. Then of course we have the employer health care benefit costs. And those are on a pay as you go, so we're not funding any of that legacy cost at the moment. Um, but also the contribution rates that uh, we as an employer are paying for the three pension plans, the uh, we have teachers retirement, we have the optional retirement plan through teachers, and then of course the uh, state employees retirement plan or lasers. Uh, we're looking at contribu employer contribution rates or shares up of 25.3% uh, up to 40.7% of employee salaries right now. And if we're going to meet that 2027 date and we have issues with uh, the the uh, funded balance dropping, we could we could have certainly uh, significant issues as well moving forward if we if the state still wants to hit that 2027 date. 
when the two trillion CARES Act stimulus fund was passed, uh, Louisiana got 147 million for uh, higher education, and our system distribution is 65 million dollars. Uh, so when we first got that, we were ready to collect 65 million dollars, but part of that cost, half of it, has to go to students. So 32.4 million was allocated to students, and two weeks ago they said you had to go through the process to apply for it. Uh, so all of our schools applied for the half uh, to go to the students. Uh, they've all applied, and uh, to my knowledge at this point, I don't think any institutions have actually received the fund, or as of yesterday, uh, nobody had received the funds yet. So $32 million is going towards students. Uh, that amount of the 64, there was a criteria that looked at students on Pell. Uh, they took out students that were 100% completely online. And then there was a 25% for other students. So that's how the allocation was determined. Uh, so the more Pell students that you had, uh, the more money you, you would get. Uh, Edward, then, if I could, this, is, uh, this was a, applied to, to all students. It was based on your FTEs. Right. Uh, and when the original guidance came out, uh, the distribution was for all students. Some of the guidance that came out this week uh, 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 changed that. It restricted the number of students. It was for Title IV eligible students, which eliminates any international students, which remember, uh, uh, eliminates any DACA students, deferred action uh, students. Uh, but it also creates a, a, a bit of an uh, administrative uh, hurdle and that verifying that students are eligible for, for Title IV aid means even verifying things like uh, criminal records, means verifying things like registration for selective service. And so our financial aid directors will be brought into the conversation with the CFOs and the presidents uh, so that we can quickly understand the process for determining eligibility and get this aid into the hands of the students as, as quickly as possible. Sorry, I think I think the biggest challenge that we had is it's a moving target right now. And so the institutions all developed plans. And this week, the plans have changed. Uh, so we're still waiting on the fund, uh, still trying to determine. Uh, I, I did a calculation and said if we gave every student a, a equal amount, it would be a little bit more than $300 per student. Uh, I looked then at just Pell students. If all of the Pell students got the money, it would be a little over a thousand dollars. So at first, when you think of thirty-two million dollars, you think that's a big chunk of change, and, and it'll help a lot of students out. Uh, but when you think about it, if you just looked at Pell students, uh, you're only going to get a little over a thousand dollars per student. Uh, that doesn't do a whole lot for us for summer and for fall, much less help them out right now in the spring. Uh, so I think part of the challenge is it looks like it's a lot, uh, but it's not. Uh, then what's been happening is our institutions have been reporting their expenses and their revenue losses each week to the state. And so through this Monday, uh, we have already expensed or had revenue losses of in excess of $26 million. Uh, some of the institutions are still working through their uh, housing and meal plan, re plan refunds. Uh, so that will continue to go up. Uh, but you can see that we'll quickly approach the $32 million that's been allocated for the universities to uh, cover, help cover the loss and help cover those expenses of going online and getting faculty uh, teaching online. So what we wanted to do is, uh, I mentioned Lauren Scott had talked about a, a potential $200 million cut. And so we were looking at a lot of different scenarios, what's gonna happen, what would be the impact if we did a 5% cut, a 10% cut, or a 20% cut. And so you can see a 5% cut would be about $11 million to the system. 10% uh, would be $22 million. 22% uh, 20 would be about $44 million. So what we wanna do is kind of give an idea of what's the potential uh, what would the institutions have to do in order to cover this? Uh, I think part of the challenge that we have is uh, you're at the end of the fiscal year. So we were talking about this the other day on, a, on a, a, a conference call was you've got the current year problem, but then you also have next year. 
So we've got a, a compounded issue that we have to deal with on when the cut comes and how much and, and where and for next year also. Now our system or institutions, 75% of their revenue comes from students. So the biggest concern right now is, is what's gonna happen to our student enrollment. I had mentioned earlier that the ACE uh, had come out with a projection that we would lose about 15%, potentially 15% of the students wouldn't come back. Uh, so we looked at what a five, 10 and a 20% reduction of student enrollment would do to our institutions. And you can see uh, what a 10 to 20% reduction would do. Uh, it would be a serious impact on our institutions. Uh, and they would have to do a, a lot in order to uh, mitigate that. And so the challenge becomes is if this would materialize and you would have the state general fund or the in the cell fund cuts, uh, it increases that magnitude. Now, the next thing we wanted to look at is, I think we're in a unique opp opportunity. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of students that went out of state that are gonna be coming back to state, coming back closer to home. We're gonna have uh, institutions or students that are gonna uh, move back home regionally. I think you're gonna have a lot of students that are gonna go from private institutions to our regional public institutions. So I think that there's a tremendous opportunity if we uh, work on it and are strategic uh, that we could see a potential increase in enrollment based upon the factors and, and, and what we're looking at. So if we just had a 2% increase in enrollment, uh, you would have a $13 million increase in revenue. And then we went through the 4%, 6%, and 8%. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, getting over the 4 6%, how re reasonable that is, but I think it shows you that uh, the enrollment is going to drive the revenue. And if we could get a 6% enrollment increase and have $41 million, I think you'll see that that would offset the loss that we would have on the state side. Now, moving into athletics, Marcus had mentioned this earlier. I think that's where we're going to have probably our, our biggest struggle uh, because with athletics and the groups and the, and the teams and having uh, attendance, you can see that where the athletic programs generate their revenue, uh, conference distributions, uh, student athletic fees. So one of the concerns is that 19% uh, of the revenue comes from student athletic fees. If enrollment's down, uh, then athletics won't be getting as much in student athletic fees. Uh, the game guarantees, ticket sales, private gifts, and other. So you can see that all of these are driven by uh, how we're doing in the economy, students, and attendance at ticket sales and games. If I could interrupt just one more time, and just to, to be clear to board members, that's an if. The expectation is that enrollment increases and that we do everything within our power as institutions to control our destiny by driving enrollment. So I want to make sure that's clear. When we talk about student enrollment decreases, that's, that's a possibility. It's certainly not the expectation. I'm sorry, Edward, go ahead. Then we kind of looked at our expenses so that you get an idea of that's on the next slide. You can get an idea of where uh, athletics is spending the, the, the re revenue that they get. And just like with our institutions, the, the majority of the uh, expenses are in salaries and related benefit and personnel costs, uh, same as our institutions. And then you can see the next biggest expense is the athletic scholarships, travel, operating services, and other. Uh, so you can see that it's in personnel and it's in the student athletes. And Charles is gonna tell you a little bit about the athletic uh, scholarships and student aid. Uh, athletics scholarships are unique among the other forms of aid. Uh, part of it is, is that you have an expense that you're picking up on the athletic side, but it's off, technically it's offset with a revenue on the operating side so that you have uh, if i've got a million dollars in scholarship expenses for athletes i'm going to have a million dollar revenue that i have recorded elsewhere 
And of course, part of part of um, what happens with those revenues as well is, is that they are recognized based on the tuition and fee schedules as opposed to the actual cost of that scholarship to the athletic, uh, the athletic funds. So it's a misnomer in some respects in terms of the actual cost of those athletic scholarships to the programs. But without the athletes, you also don't generate the athletic revenues. Um, and then there are other factors that come into play. And unfortunately, accounting standards don't really uh, allow a lot of clarity in the financial statements in terms of the effect of those scholarships. You have to remember- Members, if I can, for, uh, uh, for an accountant, an auditor like Charles to admit that an accounting rule is a misnomer is a, quite an accomplishment and I'm quite proud of that. Charles, thank you very much for, for that. You're quite welcome. And if you ask me about some of the others, I'll say it too, but I won't go there. But, uh, but anyway, but, but there are a lot of complexities, complexities in reporting that make a complex situation more complex. Perfect. Thank, thank you. For that. So. And uh, as a result of, of everything that uh, is, we're currently facing, we're looking at a variety of scenarios. And again, these are all potentials. None of these uh, uh, are written in stone at this point, but obviously we're looking at the effect of any reductions on state general fund appropriations. And what if we have decreases in fall 2020 enrollment instead of increases? And as Dr. Henderson and Edwin both said, we actually have a really good opportunity to increase our enrollments based on potential population shifts and attitudes after we come out of, uh, out of this shutdown. We also have, uh, we could consider that there could possibly be a reduction in the required contributions toward that pension UAL if the 2027 date were relaxed it's possible that there could be some relief there. The likelihood is really gonna be up to the mood of the legislature, I believe, and then also input from your pension systems. And uh, our, our primary goal obviously is to educate students. So the challenges we face are providing the ongoing services to the students. Uh, they get some of it right now. They're getting some of those services with online education, but they're not getting that campus experience. And, and so there could be shifts in, in how that occurs. We also have to look at potentially new methods of instruction. And I think that uh, the universities have faced significant challenges in going all online as much as possible or 100% or online. So that certainly is a new method of instruction from the standpoint of a whole approach. Uh, there's possibility if we were to have decreases in enrollment, then we could lose student fees paid as a part of tuition, but also we might have to address what fees we collect if students, uh, if we have a 100% a online environment, uh, would we have to adjust the fee structures for those students? But also with, with losses from student fees, losses in certain auxiliary activities, housing and, and uh, meal plans, um, we have challenges ensuring that we're going to meet our debt service requirements and satisfy the bond covenants, things like those uh, debt, debt coverage ratios. Uh, but again, meeting the debt service requirements is, is certainly going to be an ongoing concern as we get back to, to work, so to speak. And then I just added a few quotes here at the end. Uh, uh, I tried to go to people who um, weren't involved in um, governance, let's say, um, but rather uh, sort of fresh looks. And so I liked uh, Christine Lagarde uh, talking about given the nature of the crisis, all hands should be uh, on deck, all available tools, tools should be used. And I think that uh, the system certainly is doing that. And I liked what Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II said in, in one of her rare uh, appearances uh, before the cameras. And she said, today we're tackling, uh, together we're tackling this disease. And I wanna reassure you that if we remain united and resolute, then we will overcome it. 
And despite the fact that she's across uh, you know, across the, the, the pond, the fact is we can't do this if we don't do it together. And if we're not united in that effort. And then of course, uh, Anne Frank, um, somewhat prescient, I guess, is I don't think of all the misery, but the beauty that still remains. And from the standpoint of what we're facing, I think uh, an attitude of positivity has to reign because if we can't look to the future and we're mired in the present and the issues we face, we're not gonna move forward. So, so Mr. Kitchen, so members of the board, that's kind of our overview of the presentation of where we're at. Uh, we will continually update that uh, daily and weekly. And so we'll open that up to any questions that you may have. This is Virgil Robinson. Um, Edwin, uh, given the fact that our debt is pretty much tied up in bond, which has uh, fixed um, debt obligations and fixed payment structures, uh, would it be an advisable thing for us to start thinking about how we might be able to get that debt structure amended, uh, modified for a period of time to allow us to uh, evolve into the new environment that we're in? We, we've had conversations with the bond attorneys and with the financial advisors, and we've discussed the what if scenarios, what if this continues on, what if we can't make uh, the housing payments, what if we have some uh, uh, different projects that are funded based upon student fees. And so we've gone through uh, some of that discussion and talked about what would happen and we've looked at some triggers. Uh, so we're uh, in the process of, of looking at that. I think when summer enrollment comes in, uh, I think we'll have a much better picture. Uh, I've always felt like summer is a predictor of fall enrollment. Uh, so I think it'll give us a little bit clearer idea. Uh, the institutions are now in registration today, uh, pre-registration for summer and fall. So uh, I think as we get a little further down the road, we'll be in a better situation to, to act on that but we've been looking into it and talking about it. Uh, and one, one follow up to that, um, the uh, projects that we have in, in, that are in progress, that are being funded by, uh, by uh, bond debt uh, or bond debt to be, um, what impact is, or is there any impact on, the, on that? Because we got the revenues, we got the cash on hand to do it, but we don't know what the future looks like. So, uh, do we, I guess we have to continue with, to, uh, to um, continue those projects to the end and then look at whether or not we're going to have to restructure those debt or not at that point. And I think in some cases for the ones that are in the progress and, and are starting, uh, there could be the option to delay that for a period of time and, and see what happens. Um, or, or I think it's gonna depend by each institution on how much debt service they have and, and where their financial statement has uh, comes because you know one of the challenges that we have is that uh, no matter how you look at it, we have a range of nine institutions. Uh, some can handle it better than others. Some are gonna get closer to that, that trigger point uh, when we get to that point. And I think for us, it's monitoring which ones are going to have the biggest uh, struggles or impact and, and how do we help mitigate those issues. Thank you. Um, you know, with regard to that, uh, uh, the, the bond documents will dictate, uh, you know, the, what happens going down the road with regard to that indebtedness and the projects and so forth. That's, it's going to be spelled out to the extent that we violate a covenant you know, then, you know, we're going to have to probably remedy that, that, that covenant. So, um, you know, at this point in time, as long as we're in compliance and the transaction uh, has been uh, completed and funded, then, you know, we'll, we'll continue to move forward. I'm not sure we really have the flexibility to decide whether to go forward or not with the project because, the, you know, the bonds were indebtedness were issued based on completing that project. And, and, and look, uh, by the way, I, I'm sorry if I'm covering some ground, I, I lost a signal completely. We've got some bad weather rolling through here. I'm not sure. So I had to drop off for about five minutes and get back going. So, you know, 
Could and be, Mr. Kitchen, could I might add also, uh, there are issues relative to not completing a project or stopping midway, and then you have the cash on hand, and if you have non-taxable bonds, right, right. there are all kinds of issues. I won't go into those, but there are all kinds of issues relative to the potential mm -hmm. taxes or tax burden uh, that suddenly appears if you hold those funds for too long. Right. And, and that's why I said the bond documents will govern right. what, you know, what we can and can't do. Right. Okay. Edwin, th this is Jimmy. Can, can you speak just a little bit about student fees from the standpoint, um, I, I think it was referenced with the athletic department or the athletic, it was 19% of the entire funds come from student fees. What happens if services are not available uh, that students are paying for. I know that there's been lawsuits in other places for this semester. I don't know moving forward if we're calculating that or thinking about that um, and, and the potential impact. You know, I, I would certainly hope not on any sort of bonded indebtedness circumstance, but can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, you know, one of the challenges is that we have working from home is you're always at work. <laughs> So last night at nine o'clock at night, I'm talking to the CFOs and we're we're trying to, you know, discuss what's gonna happen here, what's gonna happen there. And I said, hey, how's your day going? He said, well, it just went the downhill because I just found out the CARES Act changed. Uh, you know, so I think what's happened is, is uh, as this time has extended, I think we're getting to that point to where now the stress is starting to settle in as we're looking at summer and fall. And a number of CFOs have called and said, Edwin, we're, we're looking at for summer, not charging for those fees for the things that uh, they're not gonna be able to get. And so we've talked about, okay, in, in order to do that, uh, what's gonna be our process or mechanism in order to make that happen? You've got a number of schools that are looking at uh, either reducing summer in, uh, tuition or offering scholarships for summer. So I think they're getting creative in order to do that, but I think they are looking at it and saying, in the fall, do I charge that cheerleader fee or do I charge the band fee or do I charge the newspaper fee if some of those are not going to be available? So I think they're looking at that. They're looking at their rate structures. Uh, and I think that they'll probably be uh, coming to Dr. Henderson and to the board and saying, uh, we're going to look and see, because in some cases, some of them might have a little bit of fund balance. So you could get by on your fund balance and not charge the fee for the fall semester. I think, so I think the, a lot of it will be on a case by case basis. Yeah. And, and I think, Jimmy, if I could, or Supervisor Clark, the, uh, one of the distinctions is you have things that are fees for service. Then you have fees that are tied to bond indebtedness, which is a completely different subject. And then you have things that fall in between. And so I think we'll have to look at those individually and make the right determinations. A couple of key principles. We're going to err on the side of giving access to students. And two, we're going to be extraordinarily transparent, fully transparent in every decision that we make in this regard. I think we've, we've made those principles uh, ours for the last several years. Uh, this is just an up, another opportunity for those principles to be put into play. So I hope that's fair. Uh, thank you. I, I, no, just something to be thinking about. And, uh, it, it's obviously the uncertainty pervades everything that we're talking about and not knowing, but as long as there's some you know, thoughts relative to that, I think that's good. Jim, I, I always admire your half glass full approach and your you know, expectation that a four to 6% in enrollment increase is, is up to us. Um, there are unfortunately, you know, surveys out there nationally and other places where people are projecting, you know, eight to 10% drops in public school enrollments uh, sure. for a whole host of reasons. And so I know it's all over the board. And I just think that as a, you know, as a board, um, we need to be anticipating, you know, a lot of different scenarios. So thank you for all that work. Absolutely. And listen, we, we always anticipate worst case scenarios, uh, but we, when we can control it and when we can mitigate it, we're going to make sure that... It, the worst case doesn't materialize if we've left any action on the table, right? And so we're, we're taking all actions possible. And look, we've got a lot of folks working from home. And the secret right now to enrollment, to keeping students and recruiting students is high touch, high value, making sure that you understand the needs of these students, 
that you're meeting the needs of these students and that you're not focusing necessarily on the needs of institutions. That's right. And there's a difference. You have to focus on the needs of students, the f- needs of faculty and staff, and ensure that it, once you do those things, it's amazing. At, at the minimum, you're going to mitigate the loss. At the up, ups, on the positive side, you'll, uh, you'll, 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 t- you'll reap some great benefits from that. So I'll leave it at that. I, I just got a text from Mr. Crawford. Uh, he's watching on the YouTube. He had problems connecting. But his comment was um, looking at the actions that we could take to lower expenses across the whole system. Uh, program review, uh, program elimination, salary reductions, increments, discussions with bondholders, forbearance. Uh, you know, we've talked about it a little internally, but uh, as a final step, last step, exigency, uh, if all else fails. Uh, so those are all things that we have looked at the table. Uh, we've talked about uh, putting a list of all activities and rank ordering them and, and saying, hey, what's, what's most important? Uh, make sure that we provide the academic structure for the students. Uh, so we're, we're putting all of that on there. So he wanted to make sure that we put everything on the table during the planning process uh, as we move forward. Could I jump in and, and make a comment and ask a question? Um, among this tsunami of challenge and bad news uh, about what we're facing and how uncertain it is, um, like someone else said, it was great to hear that there's a possibility we may gain students that have been displaced from private institutions or, or that are coming back home, um, that this interruption has is going to reshuffle um, opportunity. So I was looking at my other iPad. So how would I find out if I were one of those students, you know, what, what programs are available in the UL system? And, you know, where I ended up is on the Compete Louisiana website, where you can go and it has all of the various programs listed. For instance, if I was interested in completing a nursing degree, you know, it shows me that there's four, um, four, programs that you can compete complete online in nursing so you know it, it made me think are we uh, has there been any discussion about maybe increasing the budget for advertising for either and i don't know if compete can step in i mean if that's a way and if so you know if we could get the word out if this might help us maximize potential there so yeah that's that's a fabulous question you're actually going to hear a little bit more about compete louisiana later today uh, in fact, even a role that you as board members can play that I hope you'll, you'll, you'll consider. Uh, you know, that's the type of intervention that, that comes to play. And so we, our coaches have been working uh, 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 a considerable amount of time. All of our uh, faculty and staff have essentially become coaches in a very similar way. Uh, we're utilizing the best uh, 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 outreach and recruitment strategies using social media and earned media. Uh, I'll tell you that there are other providers that you see online or you hear on the radio, uh, one of which spends $110 million a year solely on outreach and recruitment, which is about 109,800,000 more than we spend on Compete Louisiana. Uh, so there is a place for, for outreach and recruitment, and that certainly will be part of our plans, because I think you're right. It, it, if we have a service, getting the information into the hands of students is absolutely vital. And there's there's a number of ways to do that. And a lot of them don't cost a lot of money. So thank you for that. Jim, uh, just real quick. Um, I, uh, I think that one time in, in any large organizations like we have, uh, the, you know, we want to incentivize students to a return so, you know, first and foremost, we're looking to recruit our own students and keep them engaged. And then secondly, you know, any students who are not currently enrolled at the UL system, you know, as you know, maybe out of state students or they're in a private school and they're looking to uh, complete their uh, education, maybe, you know, they would consider the UL system. But one of the things I wanna encourage you to develop is, is certainly the messaging, um, and to drive it down into each school um, at the lowest levels. So when a student, for example, applies to one of our nine universities and they have two years completed another school, a lot of times 
they get tied up into which courses transfer over sure. and which courses don't meet the criteria. And so, you know, I, I just use that as an example that, you know, we may as a board and as senior management have a understanding that we want to facilitate and to uh, grease the skids with regard to steps that we have to take to increase and improve and retain and maintain the enrollment. However, if that message doesn't get down to the uh, deck level, you know, person who is responsible for following the enormous number of policies and procedures, then he or she would, he would say, well, gee, uh, this person's uh, course doesn't comply or con doesn't conform with ours. And so, you know, you're, you, you can't transfer 60 hours, you can only transfer 45. And so we, we need to not only advocate and have a policy that we're talking about here to encourage students to stay in and to come to our system, but we need to make sure that in practice that we've got the right messaging, we've got the right steps that we've taken, we've pushed the right buttons, pulled the right levers, to really make that a reality. Because otherwise, I've, I've just seen in, in large bureaucratic organizations, which I hate to admit that we are one, um, but in any large bureaucratic organization, the work is really done by the people who have been there for 20 and 30 years. And they, they'll they say, well, we've never done it that well. I don't have the authority to make that except, oh, I don't, I can't, you know, so we are going to have to, in developing these plans, anticipate all of those obstacles and roadblocks and to have implement policies and authorizations to encourage, you know, to the increasing of enrollment uh, that is going to be so vital, because I think that's probably going to be number one, two, and three in terms of priorities. This Supervisor Kitchen could not have been better said. And, and I thank you for that. That's exactly the kind of work we're doing. Yeah. Folks, I, I do not want to rush any of the conversation, but I just, just got to notice that we're about to hit what's called a toll bridge on Zoom. And <laughs> if we're talking about finance, I do think we would want to avoid that. And, would, and but, but again, I don't want to interrupt the conversation well, at all, but I did want to make sure we were think, all aware of that. I think it's been excellent discussion. I appreciate <laughs> the contributions and comments from all the board members and the staff. And I think that uh, it, it's, not times like these that uh, you and the staff are going to really earn the, uh, you know, your salary. So um, I, uh, I, I, I could say a lot more, but in the interest of time, we'll drift it down. But uh, are any other comments from the board? Okay. Any other business to come before the committee? If not, Mr. Chair, that's all the items for finance. Thank you, Mr. Kitchen. This time we'll proceed with personnel, Mr. Robinson. Actually, I think we have some voting items, right? Yeah, then we need to vote if there are any items that need to vote. So Mr. Kitchen's motion to approve those items that were presented and require a vote on personnel. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, on finance? I think we did all those votes. We, we, yeah, we did thought, do that. I thought we did. So yeah, I'm sorry, it's been the discussion of number um, seven has been so extensive, I think we've uh, lost track of the fact that we did take an earlier vote. Very good. Thank you so much, Mr. Kitchen. Mr. Robinson, if you would provide the personnel committee items at this time. Mr. Robinson, you might want to mute, unmute. You got to train this old guy. Uh, I'd like to call the audit study. Of the committee. Uh, we have uh, one item on the agenda today, and Edna, would you, Edwin, would you cover that for us, please? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, item I-1 is the University of Louisiana Monroe's request for approval to appoint Dr. Donald Simpson as the Dean of the College of Health Sciences, effective July 1st, 2020. Thank you. Uh, are there any comments, any public comments, questions? Uh, anyone requires further clarification? If there are none, I would ask for a vote. Ms. Carroll, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Uh, Mr. James Carter? Yes. Can we get a motion? Yes. Is there, was there a motion? 
Mr. Thomas. Mm -hmm. Ms. Donahue, I think that was. Yes. Who said this? A second. Mr. Kitchen. Mr. Kitchen, second. Okay, Ms. Carroll. Okay, Mr. Carter. Yes. Dr. Yes. Clark. Yes. Dr. Condos. Yes. Ms. Uh, Ms. Donahoe. Yes. Uh, Mr. Kitchen. Yes. Ms. Lodiger. Yes. Ms. Methvin. Yes. Mr. Murphy. Yes. Mr. Perkins. Yes. Ms. Pierre. Ms. Pierre. Mr. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Romero. Yes. Ms. Russell. Yes. Yes. Mr. Salter. Yes. And I think I heard Ms. Pierre. Yes, I did say yes. Okay. The, the item is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Dr. Ruiz, uh, Ruiz on the uh, call? Yes, sir. Okay, you want to uh, introduce Dr. Simpson? Yes, sir, I, I'd like to introduce Don Simpson. He's a graduate of Bernice High School in Union Parish, so he is from Northeast Louisiana. I got a BS from Louisiana <laughs> Tech University in Biology, a BS from the University of Arkansas for Medical Science and Cytotechnology, a Master's of Public Health from Tulane University, a PhD from the University of Arkansas. The first appointment was an assistant professor at the University of Arkansas, became the program director for the School of Cytotechnology, and he was the chair of the Department of Laboratory Science. After that, he went to the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in Little Rock. He was an associate professor with tenure in the College of Health Professions, was a director of the Center for Rural Health and the director for Office of Public Health. After that, he went to the State University of New York, Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, Syracuse New York. He was a dean of the College of Health, Science, of Health Professions at the same time. He was an interim dean of the College of Nursing and director of the Institute of Environmental Health and Environmental Medicine. His most recent stop was at Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in Bradenton, Bradenton Florida. He was the institutional director of population health and the inaugural director, master's in public health program at Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. Congratulations, uh, Dr. Simpson. Is Dr. Simpson present? He is not. He is not, sir. Okay. All right. Well, he's got an impressive re uh, resume, and uh, we're excited to have him aboard. <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, is there other business to come before the personnel committee? Recognizing none, I will, I will yield back to the chair. The next committee is the legislative committee. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Mr. Salter will address items under the legislation committee at this time. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I would ask that uh, Cammy be uh, have an opportunity to provide an update on the 2020 regular session of the legislature, and she'll be using some of her skills to predict the future in making this uh, presentation. <laughs> Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Salter. Um, a lot has happened, lot has happened in Natchitoches in my first legislative committee report was cut for time. I'm surprised y'all haven't cut it this week. Um, for one, the, the legislature adjourned and we had to postpone you all system day at the Capitol. Uh, March 31st came and went without pomp and circumstance. We so look forward to uh, no breakfast at the mansion, no marching bands, no dance competitions on the lawn and no panicked monitoring of weather.com the week uh, prior. I will report that it was a stunningly beautiful day and would have been absolutely perfect. Um, as you saw in the timeline earlier, we have sent correspondence to the legislature throughout the, uh, the event to update them on the system and ensure um, they, can, they can answer their constituents. Um, we have also been in touch with various members individually as questions arise or just to- uh, okay. Is that everyone okay? Um, I think I mentioned earlier that Senator, Senator Fields held a conference call a couple of weeks ago uh, that allowed Dr. Henderson to provide an update and provide an opportunity for uh, members, uh, for senators to ask questions uh, uh, to better serve their districts. Uh, today, we're still unclear on exactly when the legislature will re-engage, but many are expecting meetings to kick back off early to mid-May. 
uh, despite the late start, regular session will start to will will still have to adjourn no later than June one. And because of this, it will like will likely experience another year of um, multi multiple sessions to address the budget, healthcare needs, and economic development. Uh, this will be, and we're used to it, a marathon, not a sprint, when it comes to legislative sessions. Once we have a better idea of the priorities that will be addressed and when, uh, we plan to schedule a virtual Yule System Day at the Capitol to build awareness of our system and its cultural and economic impact. Uh, though our bill tracking list carries more than 50 bills, it's unclear how many of those will remain on the table during this expedited session. Those that remain of sig significant interest to, address, to us address fee and operational autonomies, extend research opportunities, and appropriate funds. Our highest priority remains faculty reinvestment, and despite current challenges, we are optimistic that the opportunity for strategic reinvestment will still be a reality. And while it is abundantly clear that there is a lot of uncertainty ahead for the legislative process, I am heartened by the engagement of our presidents and my governmental relations colleagues, both in system and throughout higher education. I anticipate challenges ahead as we navigate the unknown and um, continue to build relationship with the relationships with the new legislators, but re remain hopeful that the work of our members, institutions, especially in response to COVID-19 speaks for itself as we make a case for policy changes and reinvestment. That's really my, my entire update. Um, like I said, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did, that'd be helpful. If I did have a crystal ball, Louise would have already broken it. So it would be of no use to us, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Cami. And uh, are there any questions or comments from the board? And any, any member of the public wish to be heard on this matter? Board members, since we are simply receiving a report, there's no uh, required on this item. So uh, Chairman Romero, this concludes the Legislative Committee report. Thank you, Mr. Salter. Dr. Henderson, at this time, would you please present your report? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, board members, you were emailed copies of personal actions for you to review. Uh, these actions have been reviewed by staff and they're uh, recommended for your approval. Mr. Chairman, we need a uh, motion and a second. Do I have a motion and a second? Um, I so move. Moved by Ms. Melton. Second. Second by Ms. Donahoe. Carol, if you would please call roll. Hey, Carol, you might want to unmute. Thank you. Is that All Mr. Right. Carter? Yes. Dr. Clark? Yes. Dr. Condos? Yes. Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Mr. Kitchen? Yes. Ms. Lodiger? Yes. Ms. Nesson? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Perkins? Yes. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. Ms. Russell? Yes. And Mr. Joe Salter? Yes. They're approved. Thank you, Carol. Mr. President, that motion is approved. I was really about to say something impactful and it was uh, muted. It was probably my best I read your lips. Yeah. Uh, members, you've heard a lot about uh, uh, this extraordinary uh, event we find ourselves in. It's, it's hard to imagine that at our last board meeting that we'd be talking about this. Uh, it was uh, March 9th that the presidents joined us uh, on the opening day of the legislative session in Baton Rouge to talk about legislative strategies and talk about priorities and to talk about reinvestments in faculty. Uh, we had no idea until that morning that we'd be talking about epidemiology and controlling the spread of, 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 a, of a pandemic. Uh, and a week later, 90% of our classes had been moved totally online. The Herculean effort by faculty, staff, and presidents is something that I'll never forget. Uh, the impact on students and the resilience of our students uh, and the cooperation of our students is something I'll never forget. And you know, one of the things we can be very proud of our efforts, uh, but we can't forget the human toll of this pandemic. Um, we've all been impacted in some degree or another. We all know someone who's either been affected, uh, uh, a business that's been uh, closed, a, uh, a, a, a friend that is under great deal of stress. We're all struggling ourselves with uh, 
the psychological and sociological impacts of isolation, and it, it can be very difficult. And we have to find ways to, to self-care. Uh, but we also understand that we've had 1,400 deaths, more than 1,400 deaths in Louisiana. It would have been far worse if not for some action taken, but those 1,400 lives uh, are gone forever. And I want to just bring to your attention one particular one. Uh, he graduated in uh, 2018 from the nursing school at Northwestern State. And he worked on the front lines in the emergency room at, at Christus Highland Hospital in Shreveport. And it was there uh, on the front line that he acquired COVID-19. Uh, and Mike Marceau passed away this year from COVID-19. Uh, he, he passed away as a hero to a lot of us. Uh, but he's also a stark reminder of the human cost of this and why it's so important that we take the, the, te the steps necessary to mitigate this, this, this terrible disease and do things to ensure that we're protected in the future. I'm very, very pleased that it's the faculty at our institutions that will do the research that allows us to, to win this battle. It's the students and the graduates and the faculty at our institutions that will ensure that we're on the front lines uh, either in direct delivery of healthcare or in support in the classroom, uh, ensuring that we're able to combat this uh, uh, and, and do the extraordinary work necessary for us to return to whatever the new normal is. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be engaged in that work with you as board members and certainly with us faculty, staff, and the presidents that, that, that we work with. So I wanted to, to bring that to your attention. I also want to talk a little bit about some business that's very important. Uh, and that's an update on the ULM presidential search. The, the, the committee met yesterday and due to the current circumstances and because of the limitations on our ability to meet as a group, uh, we did not want to sacrifice robust uh, stakeholder engagement. And so the committee voted to extend the search timeline. The on-campus interviews for the ULM presidency will take place the week of August 17th. That's the first week of the fall semester. Uh, with the full expectation that we'll be on campus uh, at that time. Of course, that's subject to change. Uh, the committee will, will next meet on May 18th to narrow the field of candidates. And I want to, uh, again, applaud Erica Calais for her extraordinary work, uh, along with Sandra Green in helping us vet candidates. Vicki Gentry, uh, the provost at Northwestern State, who will soon be the retired provost at Northwestern State, uh, has been an extraordinary uh, asset to us as we we go through this search process. Uh, they delivered uh, 18 candidates. That's probably the most uh, experientially and demographically diverse pool of qualified candidates that I've seen in a presidential search. And I'm very, very grateful to them for their work. Uh, shifting quickly to the digital divide and some things around data. One challenge we've heard about is that digital divide, meeting the needs of students that lack access to high-speed internet or the tools required for distance learning is one of our greatest priorities as a system. And I want to introduce uh, Claire Norris to provide some data relating to this issue and to talk a bit about uh, how we're going to use data at uh, unprecedented levels to inform our uh, decisions and our work. So Claire Norris, it, it, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. And I, you know, I don't know what you meant by this toll bridge, but I promise I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I just want to spend, you know, a few moments talking to you guys about the digital divide we've learned um, and how we can work together to ensure that our students have um, equitable learning experiences and access across our system. I also want to highlight or ask the question of how we can begin to use data um, to advance our work as a system. This pandemic has really highlighted the importance of data for our core establishments, healthcare, law, the economy, and of course, education. And so I, I, we just wanna make better use of, of this data. Um, so as you know, the digital divide references the gulf between those students who have access to computers and the internet and those who do not. So basically the haves and the have nots. So we just kind of wanted to get a gauge on who are the have nots and how can we re-engage them? So to assess this, we basically looked at um, how many students were logging into their LMS or learning uh, management systems. This is how they're engaging with faculty. And so what we found that was overall as a system, 
students are engaged. We had 96% of students who have logged on to their LMS since um, this pandemic started. That's huge. That means our faculty are doing the work. That means our students are getting engaged and that's exciting. Um, we do have 4% that have had no activity at all. Um, and so, but that as a system, and but this varies across our institution. So um, in terms of engagement for our students. We also wanted to know um, how, whether and how this pandemic has affected course withdrawals and institutional withdrawals. I wanna caution you a little bit about this data. The orange line represents a year ago from, from today. Um, and, and the blue line represents now. But I wanna caution you because we've made a lot of policy changes in this time. And so we're seeing that less students are withdrawing and we are seeing that less students are withdrawing from both course and the institution. The only thing I wanna caution you about is that we have moved the withdrawal date back. So we're gonna to continue to monitor this and try to understand that this data, um, but it's kind of hard to really um, kind of draw conclusions about this, this data um, as to where we are now. So um, I'll keep you posted on that, I promise. So, you know, after looking at this um, quantitative data, we asked our campuses to help us understand how you're responding to this. What students, what are you doing for those students who are at risk or who just disappeared, who haven't logged into their LMS? And I'm so grateful that we had access to the qualitative responses. I've reviewed the responses and you know, I was really overwhelmed by the way our institutions were responding. What I did was I took those responses and I threw them into a tool that could look at qualitative data and look for themes that would emerge. And one of the themes you see, um, and so the bigger words represent this was, you see this theme a lot. So faculty and staff are emailing, calling, texting students. I can tell you as a former faculty member, that's not easy. You got to get your course online. You know, you got to move all this stuff quickly and then you got to make sure your students are there and, and present and check in. Um, each campus has some sort of alert system that they're using um, to re-engage students who disappeared or who were at risk. Faculty and staff are even doing mental health checks just to make sure our students are okay, um, which is huge. Um, I know even as a student, right, it's, it's more important to hear from someone you engage with constantly than someone random. So these mental health checks from faculty um, are super powerful and advisors are really critical during this time. Um, I will tell you that students are, are starting to think about what summer will look like, what fall will look like. And so advisors can spread the message, make sure students are okay um, and comfortable with moving forward. So I, I mentioned earlier how this pandemic has really highlighted how um, we can better use data to advance our work. And so that the answer to that question, I, I, for me, sort of rests on three pillars. Um, first, I, I want to tell you, we have so much data, so much data. We also have very good data. Um, one thing maybe that we could do a little bit better is to understand how that data helps shape story as a system and our institution story. Oftentimes we just pull data that we're sort of forced to measure. One of the things that we want to do better is take what we currently have and ask questions about whether or not this data makes sense for our system story. Um, is this the right measure for our system? And so I'm, I'm not saying that we don't have good data and we haven't been using good data. I just wanna be more strategic about um, what measures we are using to represent us. So what we've done is we've established a data governance committee. That committee will be like our data police. They are gonna vet the data, make sure this is really what we want. And this is gonna answer the questions that we have regarding our students, our faculty, our staff. Um, the next um, pillar, I guess you'd say, it, I'm sorry, yep. The next pillar is focusing on today and the future. Um, we wanna move to a, a, a space where we're starting to look at real-time data. Um, what we are accustomed to doing is um, looking at historical measures. I, I call them tra trailing metrics. Um, just to give you an example, um, let's take COVID-19, this situation and our students today. It wouldn't probably be a good idea for us to take historical data 
from the past about how students are being retained or exceptions or looking at subgroups and make decisions about this, these students today, it would be a mistake. But if we move to the place where we're looking at real time data, and if we move to the place where we can say, okay, here are our current trends regarding enrollment, we can better serve our students. And I'm not here to argue we shouldn't use historical data. It's powerful where it is, but for times such as this, this access to real-time data will move our system in a direction that is amazing. I, I should also add, a lot of you brought up this idea of enrollment. And so what we're doing is we're working, we've shaped or formed a committee where we can make some pretty incredible enrollment forecast. So we can start to predict what's gonna happen um, based on historical data, of course, but also based on current funnel trends, applications, um, students who've been admitted, et cetera. But finally, we can't do this. Oops, I'm sorry, one more, go back one more. We can't do this without the doing this with a diversity and equity lens. We've got to make sure that we are looking at student success um, across subgroups, across demographics, and making sure that we are really telling a story and we are um, through looking at this lens, I think that we will meet the goals set forth um, in our strategic framework. All right, I'm ready, Jesse. Thank you. So the next steps is, at, as I said, we formed a few task force. Um, they are, it's comprised of the MVPs um, on each of the nine campuses. Um, these guys have been amazing, innovative, collaborative. And so what we're gonna do is we are working um, to create a dashboard where this data will live for our stakeholders to see. Dr. Henderson often mentions transparency. We want this data to be transparent and we want this data to tell our story. I won't go into it much because of this toll bridge thing, but here's our, our um, system sort of project uh, and an outline. I'd be happy to talk more about it one-on-one -on -one with you, but um, that's it. Uh, thank you um, for allowing us to do this great work, Dr. Henderson, and, and we're excited um, to move forward. You're on mute. You're on mute. Jim, things about you, Claire. Uh, I, I can't help but that I'm smiling. I was a little bit distracted from mute, just listening to, to Claire and her passion and her competency around data and evidence. And what an extraordinary member of our team. And that's what happens during these circumstances. Uh, you see greatness uh, uh, come to the forefront. And, and Claire, and though she represents as an example of that, of course, Cammie and, and, and her team, you know, what Ann McKesson has done with, with data uh, and with, with electronics, what Janine has done in leading, and I could name all of them, Marcus and Edwin and, and Charles and Bruce and, 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 and Carol and, and Joy, you just, you just name it. Our team has done a remarkable job. I'm very, very proud of them. So apologize for that, but Claire, thank you. Uh, moving on to something else, board members, uh, we've revised our PPM, uh, which was instituted a few years ago concerning the boards for our future award. The adjustment opens up the award to part-time students. You know, we're serving more non-traditional students who must come at part-time uh, in addition to full-time students. And the revision will allow board members to recommend all students who might meet the criteria, including compete Louisiana students. So expanding access to new population will allow us to assist more students and this revision will be effective today. Uh, no votes required, it's just an update to a PPM, but Ann McKisson will be providing you more information about this. Uh, the, the sports scholarship program has been remarkably successful and we appreciate your engagement in it. I uh, want to talk to you real quickly about something uh, called Retool Your School. Now, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in the power of social media uh, and we've got some great champions in it uh, at, at the president level. If you're not following Les Geis, you're, you're, you're missing uh, some of the driest, uh, wittiest uh, social media posts that are out there. Rick Gallo is a superstar. Uh, Boots Clune, uh, that's Jay's dog, is probably the most effective of all of us on social media. Uh, but we have some folks at a level that you may not get to see quite often. I think in Gabe Willis at, at Southeastern. Uh, uh, I think of Tanya uh, at, uh, uh, at, at, at Louisiana Tech and, and Misty Mack at, at, at Nichols. Uh, but one champion, one warrior that's out there is a guy named Gorjuan Wade at Grambling State. And I asked uh, if if Gorjuan and, and Rick Gallo could join us real quickly. 
to talk uh, for a minute about the Retool Your School program from Home Depot and how Grambling State University and the Graham fam uh, won $50,000 to retool their school. Uh, Gorjuan or Rick, if you guys are available, I'd love for you to say a word too about this project. Well, thank you, Dr. Henderson, and uh, and hello to, to all the uh, members of the board and all those who are uh, tuned in. You know, I, I read a quote recently. It said, uh, the only way to do great work is to love what you do. And, and I think that uh, that sums up uh, Gorjuan Wade and uh, the energy that he brings to Grambling State University. Uh, you know, I can't say enough about uh, how engaged he is with, with the students and all the, the extra time uh, that he takes through uh, responding to each and every uh, direct message he receives. Uh, and so when, when he uh, brought about this call of action to get students engaged in the uh, Retool Your School uh, program, they absolutely got uh, fired up. And, uh, and I'll let him talk about where the numbers were when he started and, and where we ended up. But it, it's certainly uh, an incredible, uh, you know, benefit. And I just, you know, love talking to this guy and, and just feeding off of his energy. And, uh, and I tell him quite often, he is the future of leadership at Grambling. And so uh, without further ado, I, I want to turn it over to, to Gorge Juan Wade to, to talk a little bit more about uh, Retool Your School and again, where we started, where the numbers were and where we ended up and how we ended up with the $50,000. Gorge Juan. Hey, Mr. President, and good afternoon to board members and President Henderson and President Gallo. Um, it's a great time to be a Tiger. You know, reaching your school, we started off at about 2,000 votes, and um, that was just not acceptable. So the president encouraged us to um, motivate the masses. So between the Graham fam students and our alums, um, just people who love Graham and our supporters, and all of our sister institutions within the UL system, we had a tremendous response from our other sister institutions. So we were able to push that 2,000 to over half a million votes. And it um, eventually powered us not only to first place, uh, we eventually settled for second. Um, but the top three institutions within our cluster was successful in receiving the $50,000 Home Depot grant. So President Gallo's leadership and just the enormous support and love from so many people who we didn't even know um, allowed our institution and our students to reap the benefits. So we're excited. We look forward to continue to try to do the good work that the president has empowered us to do. And thank you, President Henderson, for being there along the way to help and support us. And we're just excited to do some good work for our students. So thank you for the support. So it, it, Gorshawan, thank you. And, and President Gallo, thank you very much. Board members, it was, uh, it was fun to watch happen but probably one of the most rewarding aspects of it was when I saw uh, schools like Southeastern and Louisiana Tech and ULM and Northwestern posting in support of a sister institution at Grambling State. Uh, that, let, that let me know that this work we've done the last three and a half years to build this notion of system was working. And, uh, but it all goes back to the power of a leader in Rick Gallo who wanted to have to uh, affect an outcome who had someone that he empowered with the passion to deliver that outcome in, in Gorjon Wade. And so that's, I wanted to recognize them because everything that we do is contingent upon somebody on the ground taking ownership and delivering at a level that exceeds anybody's expectations. And that's what, that's what they did. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of Gorjon. He's, he's, a, he's a social media giant and he does great work with that. Uh, but he represents uh, Grambling State which it, with such great passion and energy, as does his president, Rick Gallo. So congratulations to both of you and to Thank the whole you. Graham fam. Uh, I should have worn, should have worn my shoes. Should have worn my shoes today. <laughs> you probably have them on. You just don't want to show us what, what's between your tie and the shoes, right? I'm, I might be barefoot today. But, uh, <laughs> but that, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. And I turn it back to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. And, and thank you, uh, Rick, and you all for all of the things you do to bring positive aspirations to Grambling. One of the greatest honors we have as board members to, is to attend commencement ceremonies. While spring ceremonies commencements are postponed at this point, we still want to provide a way to engage with graduates and would like to begin with our Compete LA students. We have six students set to graduate in May, thanks to the Compete LA intervention and we would love for you to reach out to those graduates 
to congratulate them for their accomplishments. Katie Barra will be providing contact information and student profiles for each of those graduates for our use. If you're interested in increasing your engagement with com the Compete LA program, the system is working on a, on a couple of other ways to help. The communication team will be providing social media content you can put on your channels and you're encouraged to share official social media content from the Compete LA pages. Finally, the system is working on compiling a list of students with whom you can engage and provide encouragement throughout the process. The team will provide student profiles, email addresses, and home addresses for you to engage. They're working on having branded note cards printed that will be distributed to interested board members once received. We know Compete LA students benefit from increased communication through their coaches, but adding this additional layer of encouragement from our board will certainly inspire their success. Staff will be in touch in the coming week and next steps on how you can engage with some of those folks and continue to help them through their future graduation. Due to the COVID-19 fluid impact it's having on our operations, our institutions are assessing the needs and protocols necessary to return to more normal operations in the fall. To assist in this matter, I'm assigning an ad hoc committee on post-pandemic operations. The committee is composed of our committee chairs, as well as our executive committee. Members will include Lola Dunahoe, Sean Murphy, Al Perkins, Tom Kitchen, Pam Egan, Joe Salter, Virgil Robinson, Liz Pierre, and James Carter. As the situation continues to evolve, the committee will meet to address issues that arise. I'd also like to remind all of you that your required personal financial disclosure statements are due May 15th. Um, before concluding that, I want to revert back to Dr. Henderson, see if you have some comments on the ad hoc committee. Oh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for, for creating the ad hoc committee. Uh, it's very important that our uh, that we have our board engaged in, in some, some very important, impactful decisions that we're going to have to be making. Uh, we fully expect to be open and serving our students at, at a larger scale than ever before this fall. I'm uh, it, assuming, of course, that the, that the guidelines from, uh, from our government officials and the guidance from our health experts allow us to do so. That's certainly our plan. But even with those two caveats in place, uh, we're going to have to make a lot of uh, decisions for our, uh, at the university level that uh, that we want to give some framework and some uh, some guidance as we make these types of decisions. There are things about ensuring that we have a safe environment for students and for faculty. It's going to involve lots of things. There's a lot of techno uh, technological things. There's a lot of, 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 of therapeutic interventions. There's a lot of detection. There's some logistical concerns. Certainly, it's ensuring that we create uh, 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 effective social distancing um, protocols, that we're aware of what to do if a student or a faculty member or someone shows signs of, of infection. What happens if we have a recurrence of the infection? All of these kinds of concerns. What we're asking the committee to help us do is to ensure that we have the right protocols and, and, the, and the business plan in place to ensure that as we return to work, as we return to uh, uh, that work that makes us who we are, which I think is vitally important. We're doing so in the safest, most responsible way possible. And, uh, and just appreciate the board's leadership and engagement in making that happen. Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your comments, Dr. Henderson. Uh, before concluding, I, I would certainly like to again, express a, a thank you to the ULM search committee uh, for their ongoing deliberate effort to vet candidates and ultimately appoint the next president of ULM. Uh, with the change in, in scheduling and uh, our adjustment to facilitate that deliberate process, uh, we'll be facing needs to appoint an interim president for university since the timeline is going to extend uh, past Dr. Bruno's retirement. Uh, Dr. Henderson will work with us on that and we'll have uh, considerations in our June 25th meeting. Uh, stay tuned for our details concerning that. Uh, please continue to take care of yourselves and your families. Is there any other business to come before the board at this time? Having none, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved Second. by Ms. Donahoe, 
Second by Miss Pierre. Carol, if you could call the roll. Mr. Carter? Dr. Clark? Yes. Dr. Condos? Yes. Ms. Donahoe? Yes. Mr. Kitchen? Yes. Ms. Lodiger? Yes. Ms. Methvin? Yes. Ms. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Perkins? Yep. Ms. Pierre? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Romero? Yes. Mr. Russell? Yes. Mr. Salter? Yes. It's approved. Thank you, Carol. Carol, did, Thank Carol you. this is James. Did you hear me? Yep. Okay. I did. Thanks. All right. Thanks. All right. All right. Thank you, James Carroll. Thank you for the roll call and we stand adjourned. I wish all of you the best and stay safe. Thank you, board members. Appreciate you. you.